Okay, members, you're all welcome to a meeting of the Justice Committee, and if uh, you can do the needful with any electronic devices, that would be appreciated. Um, if there's any financial or other related interests, now's the time to declare it in respect of any of the business being transacted today. If not, we'll proceed, and if members are content, we're going to take agenda items 6 to 16 before we get to agenda items 4 and 5, and that'll just assist with the meeting following the announcement that there's to be a meeting of the ad hoc committee at 3 p.m. Or at least that's the plan, that it's at 3 o'clock. And if members are content, then we'll take the oral evidence sessions in that order, and that'll be reported then by Hansard. Members are agreed. Agreed. <coughs> Apologies then from uh, Gordon Dunn, Emma Rogan, and we're joined through the Starley facility by Linda Dillon, Doug Beatty, Rachel Woods, and um, Sinead Bradley, and Gemma Dolan, um, if the clerk can just advise of any delegation of votes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, understanding Order 1156, Gordon Dunn has delegated his vote to the Chairman Paul Gibbon, and Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the Deputy Chairperson Linda Dillon. Okay, thank you. Um, item 2 then is just the draft uh, minutes of the meeting that was held on the 25th of March, and if members are content that there are true reflection of proceedings, then I will sign them accordingly. Members agreed. Matters arising. Um, item 1, just under matters arising, the Committee Forward Work Programme. There's an updated uh, programme for April to June reflecting the work items that were agreed at the meeting on the 25th of March. And um, Just within that, the Lord Chief Justice has confirmed that he will attend the committee meeting on the 24th of June, and that will be added to the Forward Work Programme, and arrangements for the evidence session then will be finalised in due course. Another item under matters arising is just the budget. The Chair of the Committee for Finance has written requesting this committee's view and comments on the DOJ expenditure proposals for 21-22 financial year by the 6th of May, and indicating that the response will likely be published on the Finance Committee's web page. So the Department is due to provide written information on its final budget allocations for the committee meeting on the 22nd of April. We'll have officials attending the meeting then on the 29th of April to discuss the allocations and group key priorities and then answer any questions that the committee uh, can consider what issues or comments that we wish to include in response to the Finance Committee uh, following that uh, process. So if members are content, we'll note the correspondence from the Committee for Finance. Item 3 uh, under this item is just the Criminal Justice Committal Reform Bill. The Lord Chief Justice has provided his views and comments on the proposed changes to the committal process as provided for in the committal reform bill and the correspondence is in the meeting pack. Um, the LCJ has indicated that he has been pressing for committal reform since 2012 and considers it to be vitally important. In his view, it is difficult to sustain any argument for retention of the current committal process and endorses the proposed changes. So, members, that submission will be added to the electronic bill folder and also uh, to the committee web pages. So, it's there for noting. At this stage, um, obviously, we'll pick up on it when we get to the informal deliberations on the bill, and that's scheduled to take place at next week's uh, committee meeting. And number four, uh, again, under matters arising, is the damages return investment bill. The department has provided a response setting out its views on the issues raised in a briefing paper from the Association of British Insurers regarding the damages bill and the notional investment portfolio used in the Scottish model to calculate a compensation settlement being overly cautious and the need to amend it to achieve a better balance of investment. The papers are in the meeting pack. The Department does not accept the AIB's view and states that the portfolio is intended to meet the specific needs of the hypothetical claimant as defined in the damages bill. The content of the portfolio is the same as that in the Scottish legislation, which was arrived at on the basis of professional advice and expertise, and the Department has confirmed with the Government Actuaries Department that the portfolio remains appropriate. So, if members are agreeable, we'll send a copy of the Department's response to the Association of British Insurers for their information, and also the information will uh, be added to the electronic bill folder and committee web pages, which we can then make reference to in due course. The next item, just under manager arising, is the Troubles Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme. An informal meeting was held on the 24th of March uh, with victims' representative groups to discuss uh, this scheme, and a note of the key issues discussed can be found, members, on pages 3 to 8 of the table pack. 
At the meeting on the 25th of March, the committee agreed to write to the Secretary of State um, for Northern Ireland and request clarification of his social media comments on potential sources of the funding uh, of the scheme. The committee also agreed to write to the representative victims group regarding holding another meeting in due course and to advise them to contact either the committee or members if any issues arise in relation to the scheme in the meantime. The committee has also asked the Finance Committee and the Committee uh, for the Executive Office to provide a copy of any relevant information that they receive regarding the estimates of costs of the scheme and the funding position and the Minister of Justice to provide updates on any further meetings with the Secretary of State. So, members, arrangements for a further informal meeting with the victims' representative uh, groups will be taken forward in due course. Again, just inform members that the Committee for Finance has forwarded a copy of correspondence that it received from the Executive Office providing the Government's Actuary Department's report on anticipated costs of the scheme. Um, this can be found again in the tabled pact. So, members, this update in this area, which I know we're keeping under constant um, review, is uh, to provide a further update um, for information purposes uh, to members. And obviously, we'll continue to pursue these issues. So, items four and five, um, we're just going to park, and we will move to agenda item six. And then we will come back to that. So, item six is the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill proposed legislative consent motion. Departmental officials attended the meeting on the 14th of January to provide a briefing on the proposed LCM in relation to the protection of police and public courts and sen sentencing bill, now known as the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill. At that time, the committee agreed to consider the matter further when the bill was available and when the executive had reached a position on the proposal to extend certain provisions in the bill to Northern Ireland by way of an LCM. The Department subsequently wrote on the 26th of January, confirming the Executive had considered and agreed the proposal to bring forward the LCM at its meeting of the 14th of January. The Department also advised that consent would be required for additional provisions, which will provide powers for the police in England and Wales to apply to the courts for an order to access special procedure material that may relate to the location of human remains. An additional written briefing from the Department on the 17th of February advised that consent will also be required for additional provisions to be included in the Bill, which relate to the powers to extract information from mobile devices and provided the draft text of the relevant clauses that the Home Office had agreed could be shared with the Committee in confidence. The Bill was subsequently introduced at Westminster on the 9th of March. The Committee agreed uh, on the 4th of March to seek the views of the Attorney General. Um, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission and the Commissioner for Children and Young People on the provisions that were included in the LCM, uh, including compatibility with the European Convention on Human Rights. The responses that had been received from the AG and the Human Rights Commission, which point to relevant articles in the ECHR that might be engaged by some of the provisions or for which additional safeguards may be recommended. The Human Rights Commission has also highlighted that there could be specific issues with regard to the impact of provisions relating to recovery of human remains and has suggested that the Committee may wish to seek views from the Independent Commission for the location of victims' remains on this particular matter. The Children's Commissioner advised that on this occasion she does not intend to provide a response to the Committee. So if members are content, um, we will forward the responses from the Attorney General and the Human Rights Commission to the Department of Justice for comments on the issues that they have raised. And again, if members are agreeable, we will request the views of the Independent Commission for the Location of Victims' Remains on the provisions relating to the location of human remains, including potential implications on its ongoing work. Upon receipt of those um, responses, then, members, we can pick this issue up again in due course if you are agreed to that cor course of action. Okay, agreed. Item 7. UK Financial Services Bill. At the meeting on the 18th of March, the committee considered correspondence from the Minister advising uh, that she had received a request from the Economic Secretary to the Treasury on the 8th of February to consider legislative consent for a clause in the Financial Services Bill. The purpose of the clause is to ensure that law enforcement is able to quickly and effect, uh, efficiently freeze and forfeit the proceeds of crime and terrorist property, not just held in bank and building society accounts, but also when electronic money and payment institution accounts. The Minister had indicated that the clause, which had been added to the Bill as a Government amendment in January, engaged devolved competence in respect of the proceeds of crime 
only and the extension of the provision to the Anti-Terrorism, Crime and Security Act 2001 in respect of freezing and forfeiting terrorist property does not require uh, legislative consent and will automatically apply to Northern Ireland upon its enactment. As of the 16th of March um, was the final date for securing uh, ALCM, the Minister had indicated to the Economic Treasury Secretary to the Treasury that it would not be feasible for an LCM to proceed within that short time scale, and the UK Government therefore tabled an amendment to the Bill so that provision does not extend to Northern Ireland. The Minister has now laid a memorandum in the Assembly on the 26th of March in accordance with the relevant standing order, explaining why an LCM is not being sought, and that can be found in the meeting pack. At the meeting on the 18th of March, members of the Committee agreed to request information from the Police Board on the implications for the powers of the PSNI and the risks given the provisions uh, will not extend to Northern Ireland and to request information from the Department of Justice on the potential consequences of not being included in the provisions and clarity of whether cryptocurrency is covered by the provision. Uh, these responses have not yet been received, members, so if we can note the memorandum that has been laid explaining why the LCM is not being sought. Uh, for the Electronic Money Institutions Clause in the UK Financial Services Bill, and then when further information is received from the Department and the Police Board, the Committee can consider that ma matter further. Members, content? Content? Okay. Okay, thank you. Item 8. The, uh, it's around amendments to the Criminal Justice um, Sentencing Licence Conditions Northern Ireland Rules. The Department of Justice officials attended a meeting on the 18th of February to provide oral evidence in closed session on the policy intent behind the proposal to make a statutory rule to amend the Criminal Justice um, Sentencing Licence Conditions Northern Ireland 2021, and the rule is subject to negative resolution procedure. The statutory responsibility for the supervision of terrorist-related offenders on licence currently rests solely with the Probation Board for Northern Ireland. Bespoke multi-agency arrangements are in place in other jurisdictions to manage and address the risk by TROs informed by specific assessment tools designed for this cadre of offender. The Department commissioned a leading academic to develop a bespoke risk assessment tool for use within Northern Ireland, which will help inform appropriate licence conditions and also assist parole review panels to determine if individuals may be safely released from prison custody on licence. The department has also included, or has concluded, uh, that a multi-agency arrangement is most appropriate for monitoring TROs on licence. Uh, the amendment to legislation is required to provide the department with discretion to assign the lead statutory responsibility for the management of TROs on licence to a body other than the probation board. During the oral evidence session, officials agreed to provide further information on benchmarking of multi-agency arrangements in place in other jurisdictions. The finalised criteria to be used to classify TROs, <coughs> excuse me, and the outline offender manager rule developed to inform early discussions with the National Probation Service. The department's response uh, in the meeting pack on pages 892 to 905 includes the list of research benchmarking that was considered, along with the outline spec for the designated case manager rule to inform discussions with the National Probation Service. The Department has advised that staff to work on the Northern Ireland centric team within the National Probation Service will be core NPSA employees with experience in working with terrorist related offenders and will not be selected from privatised companies or third party providers. The Department has also advised that the final uh, definitional criteria for TROs is not yet available, as work is ongoing to develop uh, the new model. However, the Department believes that any changes to the current criteria are likely to be minimal and operational in nature and therefore should not impact on the legislative change to designate an organisation other than the Probation Board um, to manage terrorist offenders. So, members, it's whether you have any particular views um, around this statutory rule, um, it's an area now we've explored over a number of meetings, but if there's further information or clarity that you still want to wait on before um, deciding on it, then let me know if anyone has any views on it. So, are members content with then the statutory rule that's being brought forward? I'm going to take silence as agreement here because I'm not seeing any. So, if members are content, then we'll indicate to the department to bring forward the statutory rule for us to carry out our formal consideration of it then. 
Okay. Okay, sorry. I see Rachel, your hand jumping up there. Sorry, I've been trying to click that button for a while. <laughs> Sorry, Chair, thank you for that. No, um, I'm not uh, going to try and delay this any longer. Um, just sort of in terms of the Department of Justice response about finalised criteria not being available on definitions, I appreciate that work is ongoing, but just if the committee will be briefed on that whenever that is in place. Um, certainly something that um, I would I would like to see and just have sight of, um, but certainly not um, going to delay this um, any further. Okay, thank you. That, that looks like a Northern Ireland kit that you're wearing. You're maybe celebrating. No, no. <laughs> just as the stripes. Not quite. I'm hoping for my green shirt soon, but not quite. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, we can seek that. We will, of course, want to get that information as well um, in terms of uh, that criteria. Okay, then item nine, um, the damages order 2021. So the department uh, proposes to make the statutory rule amending the personal injury discount rate under the legal principles established by the House of Lords in Wales v Wales from the current rate of 2.5% to minus 1.75%. That rule is subject to the negative resolution procedure. The department um, had initiated a statutory consultation on changing the rate in February um, 2020 and had received responses from the Government Actuaries Department and the Department of uh, Finance. Uh, members will know that the Department subsequently decided at that time not to change the rate under the existing framework in view of the decision to legislate for a new legal framework that would set the rate. Uh, given that the legislation to set the new rate um, will not now be enacted by the summer, as previ previously envisaged by the Department, the Perm Sec has reviewed that decision and now um, proposes to proceed with the change to the rate under the existing framework. So the Department has indicated that there may be an impact on the cost to defendants and the cost of insurance for business, charities, voluntary bodies and public sector. However, the legal principles for setting the rate uh, do not allow those costs to be taken into account in setting the rate. The committee has received correspondence from a GP highlighting concerns around the proposed statutory rule in terms of having an impact on indemnity rates um, for general practice in Northern Ireland. That correspondence advises that GPs in England and Wales benefit from state-backed indemnity and also that costs in Scotland are much cheaper than in Northern Ireland. And a briefing paper has also been received this morning from the Association of British Insurers outlining um, the consequences of the Department's proposal for consumers and compensators and the fact that there is no end date for this proposed rate, which um, is a concern to them. The paper was emailed uh, to all committee members earlier uh, today, whenever we have received it. So while these impacts cannot be taken into consideration in setting the rate, the committee uh, may wish to consider the wider issues that are being raised during the committee stage of the damages return on investment uh, bill. So, okay. Linda, if I can bring you in. Thank you, Chair. Obviously, a number of these concerns were raised um, in previous discussions around this issue and around what the rate would be and the, the potential fallout of that. And I accept that the Department can't take that into account, but we as MLAs outside of even being committee members certainly do have to take it into account, the impact on businesses and the, and the impact on, on public um, services and public money. I suppose one of the, the things that I think, and perhaps it's not for this committee to be fair, but I, I think we need to find a way of doing it, is that we're just taking it as a given that insurance premiums go up. Insurance companies are making significant profits and insurance premiums here are already higher than, and I mean, from reading the papers you will have seen, they're already higher than, certainly in Scotland, and I'm sure, I'm sure than many parts of England and Wales. And I think that we need to to look at why is it a given? Why is it an automatic thing that, that these premiums go up and that businesses suffer and public services suffer and insurance companies continue to make billions? I, th I think that there, there's an issue to be raised there. And I mean, if there's justification around it, fair enough, and, and we'll look at all that. And, and I'll be honest, I haven't had time to read the um, submission in the table papers, just given that the... the the period of time which we got it but um, I just think that it should not be an automatic thing it should not be a given that, w that premiums will automatically go up that I don't think that too many insurance companies will be hitting the wall anytime soon but our businesses here 
and our public services here are certainly at the at the point of hitting the wall and many of them pa well past the point of hitting the wall so I think that we need to to find a way of of <coughs> further into that whether it's through this committee or another committee it, it needs to be done Thank you Linda um, Sinead <coughs> Thanks, Chair. Can you hear me okay here? Yes, we can. No, we can't. Oh, we can't now. <laughs> Sorry. That's you again, yeah. Okay, thank you. I looked over the submission um, and I do have concerns about the, the, you know, we are copying and pasting ultimately a piece of legislation, but then the GPs are indicating that it's a different landscape here in terms of um, state indemnity or um, back, you know, cover on that. So we need to make sure that we're covering like for like, um, because if it if it's a different landscape, then the legislation might need to reflect that. And the other point being that I do accept um, the department and the minister's argument that the target is the one hundred percent, and that just has to be achieved. But that does not negate the fact that we have to understand there are consequences to that and I think we have a duty to understand them properly because there may be additional work that we need to do to remedy any unfair um, and outcomes around this legislation so I don't think we can just completely wash our hands off it and pretend that there are no consequences because they will ultimately have to be faced up to in some form or fashion at some point so I think the committee would do well if we could um, pull together some sort of real research paper on this so we're all fully informed on the consequences beyond the legislation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sinead. And Rachel? Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, just uh, like Sinead and Linda said, I appreciate the Wells v Wells judgment and what the Department of the Minister can and cannot take into consideration when introducing this legislation. However, I think there is a job for us to do um, through our scrutiny and our committee stage uh, to understand the implications, especially if there's going to be implications for the health service. Um, and, and like Linda said, in terms of the, the different landscape with the insurance companies and, um, and the, the mass profits that they gain every year. Um, I had met with AAB yesterday and they had raised concerns with me that a number of their members had um, been quite not sceptical, but had been concerned that this legislation wouldn't pass before the end of the mandate. Now, it's my understanding that we are to do you know, everything that we can do to, to do that. Um, and I don't uh, see uh, why it wouldn't, but that certainly they had raised in their paper about having the interim rate being set uh, time bound. I don't know if that is something that can be done or if it's legal or if it's been looked at, but certainly... Um, just to reflect what uh, Sinead and, and Linda have said, I think there is a body of work for us to do in terms of the impact of this, especially on other branches of government here, and if there's any budgetary implications for this going forward. Okay, well, listen, I, I agree with all of that commentary. Um, I know that the Minister has told this committee that we're not to take into account the wider impacts of how uh, this framework will impact on wider government and indeed um, society in terms of businesses and so on, but um, I, I think we do actually need to be doing all of that. Um, so I, I, I think in our consideration of the damages bill, we very much need to be getting that kind of information to help inform us. So if I can just um, break the two kind of points here, there's, there's these issues that have been raised, uh, and I do think that it needs to be part of our consideration in the damages bill, which we're putting through that committee motion for the extension next week. I think I'm right, Christine, aren't we, in the assembly? Um, so that we, we will have our, our work done on this and, and there will be a new legal framework set up. What we are dealing with in, in terms of the here and now, the proposed change around the statutory rule under the current framework, which the permanent secretary has reviewed, and the, the Department of Justice, as I understand the current framework, is it always in a position to carry out reviews as to that rate? Um, the reason we've had a rate for so long um, is because they didn't review it, um, um, but they subsequently have. 
and that was the rate that's been struck, uh, which the government actuaries and the Department of Finance both have signed off on in terms of this minus 1.75. But there's no, again, this is my understanding of it, um, there, there is no time limit, either how long or how short a current rate stays in place. That is something that the department um, can review and change following a consultation process. Um, if that addresses that kind of final point about whether or not there should be a, an interim rate, you know, a temporary rate that is set, um, it can be reviewed again by the department. If we were to continue under the existing framework of Wells v Wells, there's nothing stopping the department from carrying out another review 12 months from now. But I would expect that 12 months from now, the new legislation will be in place and you may well have a new rate under the, the new legal framework. So. So in terms of the statutory rule members, um, we need to be able to indicate to the department that the committee is content for them to bring that forward. Um, our members, Linda, I see your hand just back up there because I, I want to just finalise that if members are content with the statutory rule being brought forward. No, I am content with, with the, the statutory rule being brought forward, Chair, but just, just to back up what Sinead has said, I think we need to get clarification from the department around that indemnity issue and whether there, I mean, my understanding was the department were seeking clarification from Treasury around whether we can avail of that. And I just want to, if we can get clarification around that. Yeah, no, we will. We can add that to the areas that we we'll want information on. Okay, members. Um, then we can indicate to the department to bring forward for the formal consideration the statutory rule. The other issues that we've talked about um, will very much form part of our deliberations in terms of the, the bill and our scrutiny of that. Item 10 then, um, Civil Justice Modernisation Programme. Uh, the Minister of Justice made an oral statement to the Assembly on the 23rd of March on her plans for modernising civil and family justice over the rest of this Assembly mandate. The programme is seeking to deliver two key priorities, making the system more accessible and making it fairer, um, more proportionate and responsive. Uh, the department has now provided its draft Civil Justice Modernisation Delivery Action Plan, which it intends to republish annually and share with the committee for review. Uh, the action plan recognises the constraints of cross-cutting responsibility for civil justice and the current short mandate. A number of work streams have been developed, including enhancing information and advice services, modernising structures and jurisdictions, enhancing digital delivery and better supporting vulnerable citizens. Subject to the committee's consideration, the department proposes to publish the delivery plan and business areas will engage with the committee as work progresses. So if members uh, are content to note the um, civil justice modernisation delivery plan at this stage, unless there's any further comments or information that members have on that area. Content to, to note? Okay. Item 11, um, Private Family Law, the Early Intervention Action Plan. The committee noted information provided by the department on a proposed Private Family Law Early Resolution Action Plan at our meeting of the 22nd of October. The action plan has been developed alongside the Department of Health and aims to improve outcomes for children and families by diverting parental disputes which do not require judicial adjudication away from court and supporting the early resolution of parental disputes which do come before the courts. The development of the action plan is one of the initial steps in the Department's Civil Justice Modernisation Delivery Programme. Initial actions are focused on helping uh, demystify the courts, increasing awareness of options for resolving disputes and trialling dispute resolution tools, including an education campaign beginning with the launch of a parenting uh, agreement template to help those who want to reach agreement themselves and an animation on the benefits of mediation and implications of litigating uh, to resolve disputes. The Department now intends to publish the plan and progress initial actions, which will be followed with further stakeholder engagement to identify potential next steps. The Department will engage further with the Committee as work on substantive actions such as the pilot information sessions and mediation pilot progresses. So if members are content, um, the Committee could request um, the following information in respect of um, this clarity on any changes that have been made since the Committee considered the draft plan in October and the reasons for delay in publishing the action plan. Furthermore, a list of key stakeholders that have been involved in the development of this action plan and the work to progress the actions. 
Uh, further information on the actions that fall to the Department of Justice for which no information on progress or timescales has been provided. And finally, when further information on the financial implications will be available. So are members content that we'll um, action those areas and uh, seek further information? Agreed. Okay. Um, Agenda item 12 is the Northern Ireland Audit Office report on injury on duty schemes for the police and prison service. That's the response from the policing board uh, on, a, on the action plan. Um, the committee considered a written update from the Department of Justice on progress to implement the action plan to address the recommendations in the Northern Ireland Audit Office report on injury on duty schemes for officers in the police and the prison service at the meeting on the 25th of February and agreed to refer the update to the Northern Ireland Policing Board and request its views and comments on how this work is being taken forward in respect of PSNI officers, particularly given the intrinsic link to the ill health retirement schemes. The Policing Board has responded, outlining that while in the short term the aim is to iron out uncertainties within the regulations governing the IOD scheme only, one of the longer term objectives is the proposed movement of responsibility for the IOD process from the Board and the Department. Uh, to the PSNI, with the Board retaining some responsibility in relation to the appeals process. The Board had understood that, owing to the obvious and intrinsic link between the injury on duty and in health retirement processes, that management responsibilities in relation to both processes would be moved to the Police Service of Northern Ireland. Departmental officials have, however, indicated that no overhaul of the IEHR process is being considered at this time. Board officials are of the view that the proposals to deal with the IOD scheme only would be contrary to the spirit of the Audit Office report, which is to simplify the scheme and, in practice, could result in a serving or ex-officer being required to attend two different assessments with two different public bodies for the same conditions um, and claims, which would give rise to a variety of issues, complicating further an already complicated process, and which would undoubtedly attract negative commentary from the Audit Office as well as officers and their representatives. Uh, board officials are willing to discuss the matter further if the committee um, would find that useful. So, members, it's just to, to seek your views uh, at this stage in respect of this. I would be somewhat concerned as to why the Department isn't taking forward both elements of this process, um, but I'd be keen to hear just from members on that. Linda, your hand is up. Yeah. Thank Linda you, Dunn. Chair. Um, just I suppose to first of all say I did some work on this and during my time on the placing board, so I have um, a working knowledge of, of some of the issues and the challenges within the board in relation to this. I, I can only speak for myself, but I would think it would be good if we had a committee view on this. And I think going by what you've just said yourself, we, we may well be able to, to get that. Um, I would be fully supportive of what has been stated in the placing board's letter. I think that it is absolute madness. I don't know why you would have two separate processes for all the reasons outlined. I mean, obviously, it just doesn't make sense to have two separate processes for the for pretty much the the same thing, apart from anything else cost, but also putting the individuals through two separate processes. Um, and we all know, we've all spoke before about in terms of representing people who are claiming benefits and having to go to tribunals and different things and having to go to medical assessments and it's not an easy process and particularly if it is a mental health issue rather than a physical health issue so for for a variety of reasons I think that this just does not stack up and apart from anything else if they're already aware that the audit office are li likely to receive this negatively and what's going to happen is the audit office do another report on a separate thing that, that is very, very much linked. It, it, all they're doing is delaying the inevitable, and to me it just does not make sense in any way, shape or form. Okay. Thank you, Chair. I, I, I would agree with those comments, um, but I'd be keen if other members are of a similar mind, because I think we could write um, as a committee um, to the Department asking that this would be taken forward. So if I can bring in Rachel Woods and then Sinead Bradley. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I have no, I haven't worked on this obviously in terms of police and board or anything like this before. But I mean, just reading the paragraphs from the police and board letter, it doesn't make any sense to me to have two different process or two processes for the same thing. 
um, without understanding, you know, if there's reasons why, fine. But as Linda says, you know, going through claims for, for you know, in terms of benefits to Social Security, it is traumatic for people. It is hard and it doesn't matter how many times you have to do it. It doesn't get any easier. So having two concurrent applications running at different times can only be confusing, let alone cost wise. So I'm content with the comments and reflect that as a committee position. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, just to put on record also, you know, it's it um, does seem ludicrous that there's this, these two processes, but I'm just, I suppose, fearful. We're not overlooking anything. I don't think we are. The fact that it's been so boldly presented and um, an assertion that the Audit Office would sort of frown on it is strong enough for me at this stage, I think. And I don't, I haven't worked in detail on it. Obviously, I place a board of that, but I, I suspect that, yeah, this, this bit of a no-brainer just needs to be fixed and there's no need for that duplication, we, you know, not only just for the people involved, but public service. We can't afford to duplicate processes such as this. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Well, I know I, I had been speaking to my own colleagues on the place on board and, and took a bit of a steer from them on this and, and they very much... Um, are of a view that the department should be taking it forward um, in terms of addressing both issues because of the the inextricable link between the two. So, uh, if members are content, then we will write to the uh, to the minister um, outlining uh, the views of the policing board, but also then that we, as a committee, um, very much endorse that position and that we would want to see the department um, carrying out uh, the work in line with with what is in the spirit of the audit office report and addressing those so if members are content we'll do that okay content item 13 and i see i just have a wee note there from the speaker's office so the ad hoc committee has been pushed back to i think it's four, um 4 15 quarter past four this afternoon so um for any members that had planned to to maybe leave at three there's a little bit more time now for the committee to do that. So, um, agenda item 13 then. The Department and of Justice and the Department of Health uh, will shortly be publishing a Year 6 Action Plan under the Stopping Domestic and Sexual Violence and Abuse Strategy, as well as a Progress Report against the Year 5 Action Plan. Cross-Departmental Action Plan and Progress Report are currently being cleared by the Communities, Education and Finance Ministers and will be shared with the committee once this has been secured. In the meantime, the Department has set out a number of key actions in the plan uh, that it will be taking forward and some of the areas that have been progressed against the Year 5 Action Plan. The members are content at this stage to note the update and uh, we will consider the Year 6 Action Plan and Progress Report against the 5 Year Action Plan whenever it becomes available. Okay. Then the Items related to the correspondence section. There are 16 items of correspondence and one item in the table pack. Um, I'll draw attention just to a number of them. Uh, item 2 within correspondence, there's a letter from the Minister advising that following a request from the Northern Ireland Policing Board, she has commissioned Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Service to undertake the 2020-21 the inspection of the PSNI and has invited it to make an assessment of the PSNI's approach to the events surrounding the funeral of Mr Bobby's story and offer relevant learning to assist in policing of COVID restrictions and the press release and public statement from the Public Prosecution Service on its decisions on COVID funeral files um, submitted by the police uh, for consideration of potential offences under the Health Protection uh, Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations 2020. Um, the Minister has requested the Inspectorate be completed no later than the 14th of May. Um, the Public Prosecution Service is also carrying out uh, a review of its decision not to prosecute. Um, members will know that the Public Prosecution Service sits independent of any government department, uh, financed directly from the Department of Finance rather than the Department of Justice. And there is no oversight of the PPS in respect of the Attorney General. However, um, this committee has in the past um, had the Director of Public Prosecution Service come to it and provide an update on its work and also a, a, 
deal with areas um, of public interest. Um, obviously, it's a matter for the Public Prosecution Service, ultimately, if it wishes to engage um, with this committee. But I do think uh, we should be uh, writing to the Public Prosecution Service um, in respect of the timeline for whenever it will complete its review, because that hasn't been made public. There are other issues that I would wish to explore with the PPS in respect of its decision-making process. Uh, I understand, though, this review is currently taking place, um, and I would anticipate it would be subsequent to that, and, of course, it would be subject to the PPS uh, agreeing to come before this committee, uh, and obviously the committee would need to agree to request it to come. Um, but I certainly intend to make a proposal to the committee in due course, if not today, if other members want to comment that the Public Prosecution Service and its director uh, should come before this committee uh, to allow this committee uh, to raise a number of issues in respect of its decision-making process um, because of the wider implications that it has, in my view, uh, on the integrity of uh, the COVID uh, restriction regulations. Um, so uh, I would like, in the first instance, for the committee to write to the PPS um, to find out its timeline for whenever its review would be completed, um, and in due course, um, whenever the Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary has carried out its review, um, that is something that I think some may wish to return to. Um, but obviously, the Policing Board um, is primarily responsible for holding the Chief Constable to account in respect of the processes that it followed around that particular uh, funeral. Uh, but I would like to make that a, a proposal and that we would write to the PPS to find out uh, when it will complete its uh, review. And I'm happy to take some comments from members in respect of this. Um, Linda Dillon. Sorry, Chair. I, I should have said it, and you just moved on so quickly. I didn't get the opportunity. I have to declare an interest. I'm one of those who are being investigated by in relation to this, this issue. So I have to declare an interest. Obviously, I mean, you're only asking that we write to the PPS for a, a timeline. I have no issue with that, but it's it's just to, to make to put place on the record and, and make members aware. Okay. No, no problem. That'll be duly noted. Uh, Doug Beattie. Chair, sure, yes. Um, thank you. I, I, I'm fully supportive of, of what you're asking, actually. Um, uh, I think it's really important if they are willing to come and we can have a, have a chat with them, uh, particularly not just around the Bobby story, a funeral, but but I guess the length of time the PPS does to to come to conclusions uh, on so many really important issues. For example, we're still waiting on um, uh, their decision in regards to the files that were sent to them in in respect to Up Canova, um, and that's been quite a long time down the road as well. And I have a real concern that the PPS are, are incredibly slow, um, and although it is complicated what they're doing, they're incredibly slow in in in, in dealing with some of some of the really important issues. So uh, I would absolutely support you in, in writing to them and hopefully they will come before us. But I would like to try and ex expand it uh, beyond the, the, the Bobby story issue and, and maybe into a, a wider context, uh, including up Canova. Okay, thanks Doug. Um, well, if, if I'm happy, um, one, I've recommended that we should write to them about um, the timeline for when they're going to complete the review. I'm happy to adjust that, that we would um, invite them to come before this committee um, for members to be able to explore issues with them, including this particular incident, but also uh, we can identify other issues uh, that we would want to pick up with the Public Prosecution Service um, in advance of such a meeting. Um, and I'm happy that uh, we would make that request. But obviously, members, I'm, I'm open to the committee uh, that if you're content that I put that forward uh, for the committee to agree to that. Sinead Bradley. Yes, Chair. Um, just to put on record, I'm um, agreeable to that. And I think Doug raises a good point. It's so much about their processes and the timeliness of their processes. So there is a wider conversation to be had as well. But just to put on record my agreement. Thank you. Member, is there anyone members that disagrees? Um, and if we're content, then we will issue that invitation um, to the PPS to come before the committee and also to provide a response in respect of its timeline for completing its review uh, into the, the case around the Bobby Story funeral. Okay, well then, members, we will do that.
Item 8, um, in respect of correspondence, it's a response from the Department of Justice to the findings and recommendations in the Northern Ireland Audit Office report to a follow-up review on managing children who offend. Um, the response sets out the actions that the Youth Justice Agency is taking to address the three main recommendations in the report. Um, if members are agreeable, uh, we will refer the report and the responses to the Children's Commissioner uh, for her views on it. Um, item 18, then, in terms of the tabled pack. It is a briefing paper by the NSPCC regarding expanding the definition of position of trust and authority over children regardless of the setting or if they are employees or volunteers and welcoming the Justice Minister's recent announcement to change the law by way of an amendment to the Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. The NSPCC is asking the Committee for its support in securing the timely passage of the amendment to ensure these vital safeguarding protections for children are implemented as soon as possible, and the NSPCC is happy to provide any further information. Um, so, if Members, in terms of um, any further information that you would seek at this stage, um, it may be helpful to ask for further information on the recent uh, changes in England and Wales and other jurisdictions, which to varying degrees um, the legal protections already are in existence, um, and we could um, ask for that, um, and then we can note it in terms of the NSPCC's briefing paper, and obviously consider it in due course when the Miscellaneous Provisions Bill comes forward. Members content with that approach? Okay. Then are members content that we would action the other items of correspondence as set out in the cover sheet, unless there's particular comments on some other items that I haven't covered? Rachel Woods. Thank you, Chair. Yes, it's just in relation to item two, the violence against women and girls strategy. Obviously, we had an extensive debate on this in the chamber and um just on a note in the Minister's correspondence that she states that this is a cross-cutting issue that requires executive leadership and that she had tabled an executive paper on this matter to determine a way forward and the executive have agreed to an executive-wide violence against women and girls strategy, which would be coordinated by the executive office. Um, so I'm just wondering if it would be something that we could agree to write to the executive office to request an update on works on this. Yes, okay. I suspect, and Christine will keep me right, normally would we write to the committee rather than directly to the department, or what would be? Um, what we'll do is we'll check with the executive committee. If they've already written for the information, we can ask them for a copy, um, and if they haven't, then we can write direct and copy it to that committee. That's the process that's now in place. Okay. Okay, if you're happy with that. Rachel, Linda, Dillon? <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, just, I was actually going to come in on, on that as well and ask that we ask for an update, but that's that's good. Rachel has done that. But just very quickly then, Chair, on item um, 14.15 on the Sejini, <coughs> excuse me report, they had talked about a, a, a number of recommendations obviously have been completed, but there are those that are only partially and those that haven't been implemented at all. Just, I just want to ask the Department, how, do, how are we going to ensure that those that are partially implemented are fully implemented and those that haven't begun are implemented also. So it's really what is the follow-up to that. Okay. That's fine. We'll do that. Thank you. Okay. Then members will action the correspondence um, with those additions as outlined then in the um, cover sheet. Agreed. Um, Chairman's business, only one item, and it's, I suppose, a more topical one, and that's around the issue of online trolling, which has been covered um, not just in the past couple of days, but over a number of days. But it, it's one where I've had a number of people um, just raise it with me, and I was hoping that the committee um, would agree that uh, we could commission a research paper to provide a comparison of the laws to tackle this type of uh, activity uh, in terms of the other jurisdictions within the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland. And if there's any examples of international good practice in this area, um, and it just would be something that I would be keen to do a piece of work on, um, that may well be helpful in due course whenever we're considering uh, legislation, whether that's around stalking or potentially through the, the miscellaneous provisions bill. If there's any gaps that we have in our legal framework around this type of um, activity. If members are agreeable to that, then let me bring in um, Linda Dillon, Sinead Bradley, Rachel Woods. 
Thank you, Chair. J just a couple of quick points. I know that the, obviously previously the department have said that this doesn't come under, it's not a devolved matter, um, but I, I do think that there may be potential to look at some type of legislation around it, and I think it would be good if we can. Um, I, I certainly think we should be looking at what is best practice, and that's not just in terms of legislation. If if we can't do anything legislatively, then is there anything that can be done? We, we need to be to be looking at that and in, in my view it, it has become a real issue and we, we might potentially want to do a meeting with our counterparts in the 26 in relation to this issue but also um, if you don't mind me picking up at this point sure in relation to the committal reform because they are obviously doing a, a, a piece of work at the minute around prelim, preliminary hearings it's very different to committal our current commit reform process, but I think it might just be worth having a conversation with them in relation to that. Okay. That took me down a line I wasn't anticipating around committal reform. Sorry. Sorry you're, for no, no, you're using okay. that opportunity. You're okay. Um Sinead? Yes, Chair. Um just to say I would support that call and and it did occur to me during questioning um with the department on the stocking legislation it's to have an understanding of that grey area between trolling and stalking. Um, because, you know, from the answers they were given to me at that time, you might recall they said that actually stalking could happen under that bill exclusively online. And therefore, then we need to understand, um, I suppose, better how anonymous accounts might be traced and you know, how you could build up uh, an imagery or an informed position of whether the stalker is using anonymous accounts. Um, because I think there's a very grey area in between those two, and I'm not clear on it. And I think a piece of research might help develop our thinking around that area. Thank you. And Rachel. Thanks, Chair, and yeah, absolutely fully supportive um, of that. Um, any research that we can get uh, on, on online trolling and what we can do, and um, certainly, you know, the telecommunications is a reserved matter, um, and there are uh, conversations and bits of legislation going through Westminster on it, but certainly if there's any way that we can um, influence that or have any form of um, uh, sort of accountability and also holding the social media platforms to account. You know, they, they have a massive role in this and yes, they're in Silicon Valley and have very little regulation on them. But we've had LCMs through this committee which have included relationships and agreements between UK government and Washington. So and, you know, if there's anything that we can utilise for that and try and get our heads around where, where we can influence, especially the stocking bill and if there's anything in miscellaneous provisions, um, we would certainly welcome welcome that. We can look at that as a committee. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, listen. We will we will commission that piece of research, and then Linda had raised uh, the issue around um, committal reform and counterparts. And if you can just leave that with me to think how we're going to deal with that, because um, yeah, in previous mandates we would have met with the, the with the justice committee uh, in the Doyle. Um, I think it may have been something we done annually, um, but we certainly did do that in the past. Um, but I suppose that maybe as, as these restrictions relax, it's something that's going to be a little bit more open to us, although you can always do it by Zoom nevertheless. But in any event, if you can just leave that with me, Linda, and we'll think about um, what way we could maybe take that forward, and then I can come back to the committee on it. Well, thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, before we go back then to the two oral briefing sessions, just for completeness, um, I can deal with the any other business section if there's any other business that members have. And then if I'm not here, because I do intend to try and get into the ad hoc committee, um, and Linda's going to take over, if, if I do have to leave, then she just needs to close the meeting. So if there's no other business, then we'll go back to agenda items. Um, I think it was four and five for the oral briefing sessions. Um, so members, it's three o'clock now, so we may we may we may get through certainly the first one anyway before the ad hoc committee um, starts. Um, but if members are content, we will go to agenda item four, um, and then we'll deal with item five. 
So thank you for just working with me to go through all that other. It was quite lengthy, because obviously with the Easter recess. Um, but that's us cut up now. So item four then um, is a review of the sentencing policy, um, the proposed way forward. And officials are attending the meeting to outline the proposed way forward in relation to this issue. The relevant papers members are pages 43 right through to 771. And officials are just taking their place now. So can I welcome uh, Brian, Deputy Director, Head of Criminal uh, Justice Policy and Legislation Division, and also Angela, who is Head of the Sentencing uh, Policy Unit from the Department of Justice, uh, to the meeting. And um, I think we have coming in on the Starley facility, um, officials just down the castle there. Um, we should have Marie... Uh, she and the senior principal legal officer within the sentencing review team. And uh, this session, um, members will be recorded by Hansard, a transcript of which will be published in due course. Um, and I am at this stage going to hand over to Brian. While Brian is introducing it, if Marie, um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly there, if you could just switch on and off your um, connection. Um, just giving us a blank screen at the moment. I'm confident we can hear you, but it's just to, to get a visual from you. If you can do that, um, you'll you'll be brought back in straight away. Um, but Brian, I'm going to hand over to you at this stage to um, take us through an outline of the proposed way forward. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and and, <clears throat> and good afternoon, everyone. Um, you've already made the introduction, so I'll just go straight on. Um, <clears throat> I'm here, obviously, as, as the head of the Criminal Justice Policy and Legislation um, Division in, my, in the department. And Angela and Mara, uh, who have accompanied me at this meeting, and worked together on the sentencing review. Uh, Angela had the overall responsibility for the review, while Mara, uh, as you say, a senior lawyer in my team, led the work on sentencing guidance, tariffs for murder, and sentencing for deaths by driving offences. We're pleased to be able to brief the committee today on the Minister's decisions and the way forward for work flowing from this important review. The review itself was commissioned actually in summer 2016 by the former Justice Minister, Claire Sugden. Um, the terms of reference were shared with the committee at that, at that time, and I think it, they identified 10 specific areas of concern, making this, I think, probably the most significant review of sentencing policy in Northern Ireland for more than 15 years, uh, certainly in my time in the department. One aspect of the review, the application of unduly lenient sentencing arrangements for Crown Court cases linked to, to terrorism or organised crime, uh, was prioritised and taken forward ahead of the main review. Uh, this reflected the Department's action plan. Uh, this was linked to and, and, and uh, brought about because of the, uh, of the Department's action plan to address the Fresh Start panel's recommendations, one of which was on unduly lenient sentencing. Well, that work was done in advance, but with the work of the review itself uh, has taken a little longer than we had expected originally, uh, delayed partly by the Assembly suspension in January 17, but, um, which resulted um, in um, some subordinate um, uh, legislation in 2019 extending existing arrangements um, of, on the unduly lean sentencing to a list of identified offences. But the main sentencing review um, got underway in spring 2017. The um, small review team established an expert reference group at an early, an early stage to act in, a, in an advisory capacity and um, a review board to oversee the work. An intensive period of desk research and information gathering was followed uh, by a number of large, uh, large key, key, key stakeholder pre-consultation events as well as one-to-one -one meetings with a number of interested individuals and groups. This work culminated in papers being developed for public consultation. Recognising the complexity of the subject, the review team spent some time in developing an accessible and manageable consultation paper, which I know the committee will have seen. Now, this process was complicated by the constantly evolving nature of sentencing policy and related work streams within Northern Ireland, <clears throat> but also in neighbouring jurisdictions and further afield. All of these um, factors had to be considered and taken into account in the consultation process. The public consultation itself ran from October 2019 until 2020, February 2020, and it incorporated an extension uh, agreed by the review team on the foot of a request for an extra an additional week. As part of the consultation process, eight public engagement events were organised across Northern Ireland. These gave people the opportunity to meet the team face-to-face, -face, air their views and discuss any particular concerns. 
The responses were facilitated primarily online via the citizen space um, mechanism, but were also welcomed uh, in a variety of other formats. And a small number of people did send uh, hard copies to the, to the team. To encourage maximum engagement, given the size and detail of the consultation documents, respondents were, were advised if they chose, they could, they, they could restrict their answers to the areas that are of particular interest to them. And a number of people took up that option. Uh, this resulted in a strong response to the chapter dealing with sentencing for offences causing death by dangerous driving, where around 200 respondents were res responses were received. Responses to the other chapters were perhaps a little disappointing, typically coming in around 15 to 30 uh, responses from individuals and or, um, relevant organisations. During the process, the review team was reduced by retirement of a key, a key team member, and progress on developing recommendations was further slowed by the senior staff being diverted to urgent work on COVID uh, and to other ministerial priorities. Anyway, for, with all that, we issued a report on the responses, which we shared with the committee in September 2020. And in light of the scale of the project, um, my team adopted a staged approach to developing the final recommendations, recommendations to the minister over the following months. As you now have seen from the papers provided for today's meeting, the review team has made 54 recommendations in total, which the Minister has agreed. The, the highlights for me include the Minister's decision to set in legislation the purposes and principles of sentencing, a change that we hope will add long, long overdue clarity and understanding to the nature of sentencing, coupled with an increasing public confidence. Um, um, amongst the other recommendations which I would highlight were perhaps the recognition of victims' issues and the need for us to work with, the, with them for the system to do better, the decision to set starting points for murder tariff calculations in legislation, and for those most devastating driving cases, the decision to increase maximum available penalties for death by, uh, and indeed uh, serious injury by dangerous driving. Taken together, uh, these decisions should improve public confidence, increase transparency, and promote understanding of the complex world of sentencing. The majority of the Minister's decisions will require primary legislation, which we consider is best delivered in a single package via a, a, a discrete sentencing bill. Our intention, therefore, is to continue to refine the recommendations and work on the preparation of legislative instructions, with a view to having a bill ready for introduction early in the next mandate. In tandem with this work, we will commence implementation of those decisions which can be taken forward without legislation, so that improvements in those areas can begin during the remainder of this mandate. As I've said at, at the outset, this has been a significant and very challenging review. I could talk about it much longer, but I, I'm happy to stop at this point and give members a chance to ask questions. So, so Mr Chairman, I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you, Brian, and I have a feeling that this body of work will be subject to a fair amount of scrutiny in due course as it gets taken forward, but undoubtedly it has been a significant piece of work for the Department uh, to get us to this stage. Um, just a, a couple of, of general questions for me. Um, the significance of putting into legislation the purposes of sentencing, wh wh why is that so significant? I think. We found, totally when we spoke to people, quite, even those who had actually um, quite clear interest in sentencing, uh, understanding actually the complexities of sentencing, what judges have to take into account, uh, was not well understood. Uh, and certainly, whereas judges understand it, and clearly they've spent their careers in this area, the, the man in the, in, in the street probably has a, a very much a caricature of what actually sentencing involves and what it's meant to achieve. We've, we looked around the world at different jurisdictions. The number have actually put sentencing, uh, the, purposes, uh, the, the purposes and principles of, of sentencing into legislation. And that gives you a degree of clarity. And we felt that clarity was quite important. Uh, and also, I have to say, in the consultation period, we had some quite interesting, you know, if you, you'll have read our document, there were some quite interesting lines which made us think, you know, the purpose of consultation is not to tell people what we're going to do, it's to say, is in fact what, what, what we, we've, where we are at the moment. You know, how, did, how does it look from where you sit in the world? And, and the, some of the responses we got gave us pause for thought and have actually helped us to actually refine 
um, our proposals. So I think putting it in legislation makes good sense. It improves, it generates clarity, and also provides a framework so people can understand how the sensing process works better. Okay, because I'm, I'm just trying to understand that concept. Um, I'm not saying I necessarily disagree, but do, do we need to have it in legislation for the public to be able to have a, a reference point that gives them an understanding? You know, it doesn't seem to me that that's what you use legislation for. If, however, it's to allow judges, I know you say that the judiciary know their job and understand it. Don't disagree with that, but. If, to me, legislation is more to ensure that if this is the process, that it's actually being followed by those that are going to be presiding over it, and that would be the judiciary. I think, in fact, it, it, it fulfils both purposes. Clearly, um, it does provide a framework. In fact, indeed, having established some purposes and purposes and principles and, pr and purposes, um, we actually look, use that as a framework as we look through up the various elements of the work. And that actually helped to provide, provide a more coherent structure to the work. So it was quite useful in that front. And I think certainly where in putting the things in legislation, it makes things clear. And I don't think actually it's particularly revolutionary to say, you know, that in terms of purposes, you know, your sentencing should be fair, proportionate and, and transparent. Now, so in some jurisdictions, you know, the transparency of sentencing is very, is very, um, is very poor. I'm not sure it's quite as bad here. But at the same time, you know, transparency is not a bad, um, a bad um, objective as part of your overall approach. Um, but, it, but ultimately, I think we did find a lot of people had, in the in the in the public, had perhaps a, a less uh, complete understanding of how sentencing works and the factors taken on board. So we saw it as part of actually um, having a, generating a more coherent approach. It has been used in other jurisdictions, and certainly they seem to have found it, it helped. So, you know, there's, there's always different ways of skinning cats, but, um, but certainly I think we, we were quite impressed by the jurisdiction which had used that sort of approach, and we felt it did provide a useful framework. Okay, so in, in terms of some of the changes that are coming forward, um, which ones are going to be in the miscellaneous bill, um, if any? None. Okay. So uh, I say none because realistically, uh, um, there's always a prospect of people put, trying to put, put, trying or deciding to put things in early. But in fact, I know elsewhere we are wrestling with other bits of legislation which have been put in piecemeal in different bits, different in, different legislative instruments. And then we talk about how do we consolidate these downstream because what happens is, in fact, you lose coherence. Bearing in mind we've done a solid body of work, we, 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 our, the aim is to produce a sentencing bill. It makes awfully good sense to have all that sentencing work in the sentencing bill within the framework of the, of the purposes and, um, and principles um, with a coherent approach going through it. So, you know, whereas I'm sure some bits, you know, in theory could be put into miscellaneous provisions, I'm conscious that bill, which you'll be seeing um, not before too long, but in fact, we are, I'm just looking at the final draft at the moment, um, that's going forward. But, the real, but realistically, um, as it is, the minister has noted a few things she wanted in it couldn't be done within the time, so they'll be coming into the amendments. I'm sure the committee will have some amendments itself. And to be honest, actually, a miscellaneous provisions bill is about picking up you know, the bits and pieces. You know, there's a lot of sense where you actually are going to have a sentencing bill to bring all those sentencing elements, elements together into one place, operating within the same framework. So that would be certainly the minister's preference. And in terms of from a legal, legal perspective, it makes more sense that to have all of those things in, in the one place rather than dropping amendments or dropping clauses into bills which they don't quite fit into and which um, it requires people to look at two pieces of legislation to find an answer to one question sometimes. Yeah. I don't know, Angela, if you want to add anything to that? No, I think that really covers it pretty concisely, Brian. Yeah. Well, I have, to, I have to be nice to my lawyers, you see, because... Uh, I know, I know it's like out of control. The old day. That there has been a, a major piece of work done recently in England and Wales to consolidate all sentencing legislation as well for that very reason, just to keep things in, in one place so it's easy for the user to actually identify the, the, the relevant law. I, I get that argument. I think it's difficult, though, for MLAs to resist an opportunity to bring forward amendments. And if there's things that are so obvious in this sentencing, take the dangerous driving one, for example, that the minister was already endorsed. It's very difficult to ask MLAs when they have an opportunity to do something not to do it. 
albeit you make a, a compelling argument that it's better to be consolidated in an overall uh, sentencing bill. But I just flag that up that I think in the miscellaneous bill, a number of members are going to be tempted to, to seek changes or, around quite a range of different aspects of the criminal justice system. But it's always good to resist temptation, of course. <laughs> and yes, I, I might add that um, it takes us, and I have an expert team working for me, it takes us a year to produce a piece of legislation once we've got to this sort of stage. You know, to put something into a, a bill as an amendment. Say, you know, some of these areas, we're not talking about most of these things aren't going to be what a single clause. They're going to be a, a group of interlinked components. Trying to fill, put an amendment in which covers the ground appropriately and fully, um, you know, at, with a, over a very short time period, there's, there's a much heightened risk of poor law. Yeah. You know, I'm, I, I'm, my job is actually to, to help the, to, the Assembly to produce good law. And, um, you know, if amendments come in, we'll do our best to try to work with whoever to try to make sure it's as good as it can be. But I can tell you the difference between our team try, putting something together over a one-year period and working with our uh, departmental lawyers, with my own lawyers, and with, with the Office of, of Legislative Draftsman to get these things right over that time frame produces much better yeah. outcomes and actually something which comes out of the blue where we've got a very short period to try to see whether it's going to work and see how it fits. Wow. So, in fact, you know, I mean, it's important that the, the members have the capacity to produce amendments, but there are amendments and amendments. In some areas, you know, I, I would like to make sure we get very good law here and um, it would be unfortunate if we actually sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater by just and try and take shortcuts. Yeah. Finally, for me... Um, Obviously, all the work's being prepared for the next mandate. But what's to say the next Justice Minister doesn't disagree fundamentally with some of the proposals and wants to change it? Well, that's certainly possible. But in fact, we have put this document. You, every, this committee has seen that document. We are actually, the ministers made announcements. You know, the bottom line is this is in the public domain. Uh, if, in fact, a future minister or a future uh, assembly disagrees, that's, of course, they're, 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 they're right. Uh, but what we can say is, in fact, this is based on a very solid body of evidence and work. I'm not saying on the margins a minister might have a different emphasis or a different priority and some things might change. Um, but this is evidence-based. It's based on a, a thorough and comprehensive piece of work where we, ha where we have actually... We've had an extensive pre-consultation period which helped us to, to, to gather our thoughts before we consulted the consultation has been very helpful. By and large, you know, there will be people on the margins to say, yes, we should have done things differently. But there's a fairly good level of actually agreement with the broad approach. Um, so given that, that unless actually there's a radical change in government in the next election, I, I'd be surprised if a, if a future minister, when presented with a, a solid piece of work, well-researched, well-supported, uh, generally well-supported, I suspect, um, by the, the various interest groups, uh, I'd be surprised if it, didn't, if it wouldn't go forward in near enough that form. OK. But well, I, I, I can't predict the future, of course. No, no, no. We'll, we'll wait and see if that transpires to be the case. I have no reason to think why it wouldn't be, but however. Let, let me bring in other members at this stage. So, Linda Dillon. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for the presentation. Appreciate it. Um, I'm probably pretty much of the same view as in terms of, of right good law rather than fast law. But, I mean, the chair, I'm sure, is, is focused on the dangerous driving in relation to the fact that we, the committee actually had an informal meeting this week with the, the parents of Enda Dolan, Peter and Neve Dolan, and obviously they have campaigned hard to have the the increased minimum sentence in relation to death by dangerous driving, death or serious injury by da dangerous driving. Um, I suppose a couple of questions around that. I am actually probably more in favour of ensuring that it is as part of the, the full Im implementation of the sentence review because I f personally feel, and this is one of the questions I want to ask of the department, is that that sentence or increased sentence can't come on its own because if we want it to serve as a deterrent, people need to know that it exists. And I'm quite certain that, you know, there are very few people out there 
who have partaken in this offence that knew that the potential maximum sentence for them was 14 years, how are we going to ensure that they know that the new potential maximum sentence for them is 20 years? So we watched, like, there's some really good advertising campaigns, and I, I have to say I'm fully supportive of them. I think that they're very good and will certainly impact people like me. And anybody who has a conscience will be impacted by those advertisements. However, somebody who is heavily under the influence of drugs and alcohol, I'm not sure are going to be so much influenced. Unfortunately, that's just not what drives them. Self-preservation might. So we're in those adverts. Do we make sure that those people know as well as the consequence for all of these families and these people who will never see their loved ones coming home again? What are the consequences for you and your family? Because unfortunately, some of these individuals only care about them and their families and not about anybody else's family. So I, I would I would like to, to, to know what what the department's thinking is around that. Also, the, the family made us aware, and it wasn't something that I was personally aware of, that the 14-year the um, maximum sentence, sorry, I think I might have said minimum earlier there when I was speaking, but maximum sentence has never been um, used. Can we get some clarity on what increase in the sentence to 20 years is going to actually achieve? And again, do, do we know why or what would the circumstances be under which, and the department may well not be able to answer this question, but I do think that the committee should get some clarification around it. What, under what circumstances would somebody actually get the maximum sentence? I think it's important that, that we have some understanding of that. But people have also raised previously, Chair, the issue around remorse, you know, and, and showing remorse and what impact that has on a sentence i i'm really not i'm torn on it because very often people will show remorse in court because they've been told to do so by their barrister this will this will have an, an implication for your your sentence so it, that's a difficult one and i'm not sure how we resolve it i'm, I'm just wondering to the department of views around that and um, and say I've, I've also raised the the issue around the the advertising and just finally consistency I would actually, sorry, just to say, I would actually share the the, the church view that um, he raised on on you know putting this in legislation and how that, sorry, not the consistency issue, but the issue the chair raised at the beginning, putting it in legislation and how that actually whether it's required. I, I would I would share the church view on that. But finally, my point is just around consistency and how do we sure ensure consistency whilst also obviously protecting the independence and, and the integrity of the judiciary to, to make decisions around sentencing, but how do we ensure consistency in, in relation to sentencing? Okay, well, <clears throat> you've raised a <clears throat> number of questions. I'll pick those up and I might pass you over to uh, Mara Sheehan, my colleague, actually, towards the end on the consistency point. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> on the... Uh, 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 and the, the Nolan family and others, we actually have met with them several times. I know the ministers met a few times with them as well. So, in fact, they've been quite well, they've been participants in, our, in our, shaping our thinking. And indeed, actually, they, they heard about the ministers' decisions actually at the same time the committee did, actually, so in advance of the, the other decisions. Um, the reality is, in fact, <laughs> These sort of, this, this isn't, the, the, the death by danger driving is a difficult one because we know, whereas deterrence is clearly one of the things we want to achieve by actually sentencing, we also know that the, pe the, the people who commit these offences don't, don't commit the offence normally with the idea, I must go out and kill someone. They, they actually just, they are almost criminally reckless insofar as they drink or take drugs um, to the point where they, they lose uh, any sort of inhibition or a normal uh, good sense and then they go out driving what is a lethal a lethal a lethal weapon uh, and then kill someone so in fact it, the whole issue is in fact you know in quite often that's why death by dangerous driving is a problem is, is a complex one because ultimately usually where people uh, 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 death is occurred it's a murder or a manslaughter uh, a lot of these cases do do actually turn into manslaughter and have been in a small number of cases have been prosecuted that way in the past where there's been completely total reckless behavior but the truth is we have to leave it 
the, 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 our system is based on actually judicial discretion. And that's one of the strong messages came out from us going around and talking to all of the participants who are of the consultation and our pre-consultation. There was a strong support for minister, the discretion of judges. We recognise that ultimately, when you say, well, the maximum sentence, the maximum sentence is there. But ultimately, judges have to look at all the factors relating to a case. And from those factors, they draw, they draw a conclusion. Um, in s some areas, we will actually, um, the, the uh, sentencing guidelines will be drawn up, uh, or else case, um, court of appeal cases may well become guideline cases, and that helps judges to make sure they've got the, a consistent approach. But at the end of the day, the only person who can make that judgment is someone who actually sits through, in that judiciary capacity, sits through the whole of the case, hears all the evidence, and is able to weigh it and balance it. And the truth is, actually, ministers or indeed MLAs one step or two steps removed from that process are not necessarily the best place to make the judgments. And I, and I think that's the basis of our system, and certainly there was very strong support for that continued judicial discretion. But you're quite right, though, on this, if we're going to make, our aim isn't, in fact, to try to catch more people. Our aim is actually to prevent offending. And certainly, a sentencing is part of that prevention to the degree people have a, they have a fuller understanding of the consequences of their actions then at least some of those people may actually make different, uh, better judgment calls uh, about, the, about what to do. So our, you would have noticed we had a whole section in our report on actually the public perceptions and actually public influence. And actually, I think certainly a campaign improving people's awareness about sentencing, about the impacts of crime, uh, about actually how the system works. You know, those will all actually hopefully contribute um, to actually a better understanding. And certainly within that, there will be room for specific campaigns in areas which we have particular concerns about. And I would have thought death by dangerous driving is one which we would want to do with the Department for Infrastructure, uh, where we have a shared interest um, in, in making sure that these sort of cases are, are, are eliminated or certainly reduced. So I think that's wh um, where you are. On the 20-year maximum, how does this impact on other sentences? Well, this is um, really, um, it's like a piece of elastic. If, in fact, if, the, the, if the, well, the continuum goes up to 14 years and we stretch it to 20 years, you'll find all the other cases, the sentencing will actually move upwards proportionally in the same way. So we'd expect it will, have, it will result where actually the, the, the facts merit it in a general sort of increase in the, in the sentencing uh, levels. Uh, because certainly the judiciary in looking at at the, the, their choices, they look at what the, what the maximum sentence is, and if the maximum is higher, then in fact they will actually treat it as a more serious offence. Therefore, in fact, lesser offences within that continuum will, will actually be scored uh, more seriously than they would have done otherwise. On remorse as part of sentence, well, again, ultimately the only person who can actually make a judgment call on that is certainly not me. It has to be a judge, and the judge actually has to look at that. Uh, um, and make, make a judgment call himself about actually where it is. And certainly, um, you may well find in courts people are often remorseful, but they may be remorseful about being caught rather than actually um, the, about what they've done. And ultimately, it's, it's, a, it's a judgment call, and the only person who is equipped or placed to make that call has to be the judge, judge himself or herself. And then on consistency in, in terms of legislation, I wonder, Myra, do you want to pick that one up for me? Yes. Can you hear me? Oh, and speak up a bit or go nearer the mic. Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, in relation to consistency, the, there's a number of tools that obviously the judiciary use and the sentencing framework will hopefully also provide. Um, one of those is clearly the sentencing guideline cases or guidance which aim to give a consistency of approach in sentencing rather than assuming that the outcome has to be the same. Many cases are, are obviously different. So it's a consistency of approach and our review paper has been written to adopt that approach as opposed to the American type of sentencing grid where um, it was more pick numbers. Um, the events gave certain numerical um, weighting and that. So we followed essentially what is already happening in England, Wales and Scotland, and also the guideline case approach that we currently have in this jurisdiction. Um, consistency of approach would probably be helped by having the purposes of sentencing in statute as well, because that will introduce to be consistent with the purposes. Um, so, and there is a risk 
and, there, and that's the public perception. There is the risk always of people observing differences in sentencing outcomes and assuming that they're actually the same for, as opposed to having individualized circumstances. Um, you did raise about the kind of remorse and I would bring to your attention that there is actually gangland cases um, but on discount credit for plea because many people and the victims we engaged with expressed reservations about a, a, a plea of guilty being also considered to be remorse. Um, I think it's fair to say that it's not always accepted as remorse but the judiciary are on apply uh, credit in relation to plea and in circumstances of the case they consider whether it indicates remorse. Um, so as Brian said the judicial judgment made uh, in relation to the specific case. Okay. I might just add that <clears throat> at the end of the day what well, we're not looking for a painting by numbers approach where you know the judge is actually essentially sidelined you just have a formula for actually awarding awarding sentences essentially we recognize that all cases are different and all cases are unique to themselves so you do need to have someone there with that expert knowledge and whatever but prepare working within a clear framework but prepare to listen and hear all the evidence um, and then make a judgment call and certainly uh, the guidelines actually provide a frame, uh, help to provide, provide that framework, but we still need that discretion because, in fact, no two cases are the same. And, and actually, ultimately, you do need to, act, to exercise judicial judgment in making, in making a call as to what the appropriate sentence is. I, 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 thank you, Chair. I absolutely accept that. And, and t t just to, for clarification, I w certainly wouldn't, when I talk about consistency, I don't mean everybody getting the same sentence for the for the same offence because I would be very, very clear that every single case is different. There are no two cases the same, never mind every case the same. So I absolutely accept that assertion. And I think probably maybe a conversation between the department or the judiciary and media would be helpful because headlines is where it's at. And that's unfortunately what gets out there into the public domain, you know, and, and this comparison of, you know, somebody did this and got this sentence and then someone else took a life and got this sentence, but without any context whatsoever. And I think that, I mean, media have certainly been talked about by other bodies around media guidelines and how they, they behave and report. And I think there would be value in a conversation with them around that issue. But I do think that one around, um, you know any type of advertising campaign it is important that that you know there is an awareness that the sentence has increased otherwise it, it is of no use as a deterrent and also just in relation to you know you had said obviously there was, would be a campaign with dfa on that which is great but education needs to be brought into it as well we need our young people to know and understand the serious consequences of their actions whenever they get behind the wheel of a car or in relation to any other offence for that matter. Sorry. Thank you, appreciate it. That's an important component, actually, of, of our review, but you saw that section on the public perception. Yeah. You know, I think that's quite important. It's about actually making sure people understand how the law works and what their roles and responsibilities are <coughs> in it. And sadly, uh, it, it's too easy for uh, the media, I'm not going to start beating up the media, as they do a good job. But it's, it is sometimes a bit easy for them to pick up at a, someone comes out of a court in shock and they make uh, a statement uh, that this isn't right, or this isn't just, and it's picked up as a headline. And really, you know, it, what, it, what it doesn't show is just the amount of actual thought and care and whatever has gone into that decision. And actually, it doesn't show all the facts. And the truth is, in fact, it, some terrible things happen, and actually judges make difficult calls. They all try to operate on a consistent basis. And actually, for times, they can get things wrong, and certainly we, we have got... Uh, we've certainly strengthened the rules about unduly lenient sentencing. So, in fact, there is a, an increased capacity for cases to be challenged where the, the, um, it appears there's been a, a significant sort of a difference in the sentence and what you would have expected. Um, but, that, but so there is some sort of course where, exceptionally, there has been a, 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 an untoward sentence passed. But the reality is, in fact, you know, the, the, there is no easy way, and the best way is actually to promote understanding of how the system works uh, but of course, that's perhaps sometimes lesser news than actually a headline-grabbing 
um, a cry of anguish from a, from a victim or, or whoever. So, you know, I think what we have to do is actually help the public understand how the system works. And that's something that will be part of the work which we'll be taking forward uh, as following on from this review. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Chair. All for eight. Yeah, thank you. What, what would be in the miscellaneous bill that's coming before us soon that would give you the confidence that some of these offences within this and some of the increase in tariffs that some would want to see would actually meet perfume and scope of that miscellaneous bill? It's a miscellaneous provision bill, therefore potentially it has a fairly wide scope. And obviously the judgment to call on just how wide that scope is will be down to the Speaker's office and, uh, and indeed I, I know we, we are talking to the office, the first legislative draftsman, but the reality is that neither the Department nor the first legislative draftsman um, determine the scope. It is actually down to the, the Speaker's office. So, you know, in, in, in theory, almost anything can go in. Um, if, that's, if it's deemed to have an, a sufficiently wide scope. Uh, our, the dilemma is actually trying to put, there's a difference, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of my time writing legis or being involved in legislation in recent years, and I know the amount of effort it takes us to bring something to the point where we can lay it, uh, to try to, try to um, if you have a very discreet um, item which you want to add into a miscellaneous provisions bill, which is one simple clause with no consequences and no impact on other areas. Um, that's not necessarily difficult to do, but at the same time, obviously, we have finite time to put in, deal with any amendments that come along. If you're picking up, say, death by dangerous driving, where you look at that and the number of recommendations the ministers, uh, decisions the ministers made, there's a whole class, you know, there's a, there's a large number of them. They interrelate. You know, you wouldn't be putting in a clause, you'd be putting in another chapter or section, a number of sections into a, into a miscellaneous provisions bill. I'm not confident that from a standing start, we could, I could do that, or my team could do that within the time available. So I'm even less confident that, you know, if it's coming from outside, that we would be able to actually deliver it in a way which actually would make good law. And, and you have a lot more experience than I have, certainly, with regards to legislation, but surely, as, and I could be wrong, but is a miscellaneous bill not something whereby there's three items or more contained within a bill, uh, three, three aspects of law contained within the bill, and then surely... Any MLA to bring forward amendments to a miscellaneous bill, there has to be something to hang your hat on contained already within that bill. That's, that's the way it's, 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 um, it works. In practice, the Speaker's Office will make a judgment call about what constitutes scope. Uh, and in the past, some um, different <coughs> speakers have had different approaches and a different degree of latitude. Uh, I'm at this stage, in fact, it, you know, I, I, it's not, I can't predict how that would go. What I can say is the Miscellaneous Provision Bill will actually have a number of clauses. It's mainly a revolving around sexual offences um, and victims. Uh, but because it also has a legal aid, it has a range of other things in there, you know, it, it is quite wide scoped. So in fact, I, um, so it's quite possible that fairly, it's a fairly widely scoped issues could come into it. Would it be the case that if out of a miscellaneous bill there is a new offence created which has then a tariff or sentence that then any offence could be created and sort of into a miscellaneous bill considering it, that will also have a tariff or a sentence also would it be as wide as that um, this, th these are interesting technical discussions. I don't know whether if I want to pick up um, one of my legal advisors to pick up on this, but I think it's fair to say that on scope, the aim, indeed, the department agreed with the committee at the beginning of this mandate um, that the department that uh, the department would aim to put in narrowly scoped bills for the for to the committee because we recognise the, the problems the committee has in actually managing omnibus bills. Um, now, this isn't an omnibus bill, but by definition, a miscellaneous provisions bill, which is designed to pick up usually all the loose ends, the, the bits and pieces which come, come up in, in the course of a mandate where um, there's a need for corrections or adjustments, or in fact, there's non-contentious sort of developments. Um, that's what it's meant to pick up. But the reality is, in fact, it is by that, because it's doing that, it is covering a quite a wide range of areas, and that does seem to increase the scope. Yeah. Uh, but I, it's, not, it's not really, I'm not in a position where I can give you a definition of what scope it should have. 
uh, I can have my own view, but the reality is, in fact, that's not worth no more than anybody else's view. It, it, ultimately, the Speaker will look at that in the context of what the Bill has and what uh, is being proposed as a possible amendment. I suppose why I'm asking these questions is because I, I, don't, I don't lend to the theory that all of these topics should be in what would be construed or called a sentencing bill or, or sort of such like. And I'll give you an example. Um, so we know that for frontline providers at the blue lights, police, fire, and now ambulance, which some, which I brought in, uh, they're very good offences. People can understand why there should be a, a, a greater tariff for attacking those people because if you bring them out of, take them out of service, you're not only hurting that person, but you could be threatening the life of someone else on down the stream, work stream. So those, those three sentences, I think, were all brought in at different varying times, and that's fine. What a miscellaneous bill could do, if you were going to add to that list, and it's been remarked here, I think, by the Minister, is that you would then use a miscellaneous bill to create a new offence with a wider range of frontline workers, and you would bring those three occupations contained within that and create a fresh piece of legislation. Now, that's actually just, I think, good common sense. But there was nothing ever wrong with the three occupation pieces in the first place. And why I say that is this. When you're a victim out there, you don't really care what the statute book looks like. No. Uh, nor do you care where the lawyer has to flick to. Uh, you just want the lawyer to do the job and you know so there I have a I have a probably a concern or an issue that if if something needs doing and it needs doing now, MLA should use all avenues and tools at their disposal in order to, to achieve that. That that's not to say that in two years time, three years time or even the next term that things cannot be tidied up and made better. That's actually just a good thing. Um, so, so I suppose I worry that you would hold off on things, or on on changes to law and creation of offences and increasing tariffs for a sentencing bill or sentencing review bill or whatever, because I'm only in politics full time politics eleven years, but sometimes chances are missed, and and. That would worry me more than someone, MLA, who are looking to do good, inserting a clause in a miscellaneous bill which is deemed to meet scope uh, and change law for the better. You see where I'm coming from? I, I just I worry about why do we need a specific sentencing bill whenever every single bill we produce in this place Usually comes with a sent, comes with a with, with an offence, and then comes with a setting of a tariff. That, that that's what legislation is. It's, it's yes, to create offences. My and my division gives advice to all departments on on tariffs and, uh, and offences and uh, penalties. Um, so I'm well aware of that. The dilemma, ultimately, there's different ways of skinning cats. But certainly, where you have had a coherent review, where in fact. The, um, a lot of our, the judgment calls of our, of our review team have been built on the framework which we set up at the beginning of the review. It's linked into the whole public perception work. It's linked into some of the, the community sentencing and how that intermeshes with actually other uh, more serious sentences. Um, those all actually are, become a coherent whole, pulling bits out. You just make the, fair enough. You just say, well, lawyers, that's lawyers' jobs. <clears throat> they go around and find all the bits. <clears throat> but for the point of view of the law, it actually is a lot better and you have fewer errors downstream if you have things in one place, where, it, particularly where you've actually gone to a great deal of trouble to produce a whole set of bit of work, body of work on sentencing, which actually is inter interconnected, um, to pull the parts, to put things in for, you know, um, I don't know, for good, good reason, but in fact, um, at the same time, what you do is you just make the law more complex and you also increase the risk of error. 
And of course, in this case, you might say, well, OK, you've got three, three services covered. We're talking about the minister agreeing to emergency service being covered, which is much broader. That's a good thing. But the reality is those services at the moment under legislation are covered anyway. And part of, one of the reasons we, the ministers agreed to increase in the sentence is because what's happened is, in fact, the original sentences were higher for, for offences against policemen and, and some others. Um, but what happened to law changed elsewhere, and the, like those other offences caught up. So that differentiation disappeared. So this isn't just about adding an extra professional or two into the block. It's about doing a number of, of interlinked changes. It's also about increasing sentencing, and that has to, again to be seen more broadly. So I actually understand where you're coming from, um, but I think, um, and it'll be, it's, it's obviously, um, I can understand why you say, well, why not do something now when you decide you want to do it? But in fact, if you're going to try to develop good coherent law, it does make good sense to have bills which cover that. Just as domestic abuse, which you've just gone through, you know, you could have dropped bits of that into other legislation earlier. Um, but in fact, indeed, I'm, you're, you'll be looking at centre, um, stalking. You know, it's not dissimilar. You know, there was a suggestion, well, why didn't you put stalking somewhere else into domestic abuse? And you could have done that, but it would have missed the whole class of people. You know, people who did not have domestic arrangement, domestic connection with the, the victim, uh, but were, were, were dis, dis, uh, delivering this sort of activity. So, um, you know, so I think there are always questions, but I think you have to be very careful on these ones about actually not you know, fragmenting an approach. And in, in that fragmentation, that you, you create risk of error and confusion. So, um, so, you know, I understand where you're coming from, but I, I think probably, I, I, and indeed the Minister is very clear that in fact a, a coherent sentencing review should actually produce, a, uh, particularly given that we've come up with about 54 recommendations for legislative change. I'd much rather see those as a block of, tra a block of, of coherent, a coherent block of, of clauses for a sentencing bill than actually dissipating them. Because, you know, otherwise you could put one here, one there, and downstream, uh, the first legislative of draftsman's office would be actually doing what they're doing elsewhere, is actually looking at how we consolidate this legislation, which is all over the place, and people are missing bits and making, making errors. Yeah, sure. Uh, and again, it's just uh, probably no more of a meeting the minds, but I, I get your point also with regards to why you would want it in the one place, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the case, uh, it's because for out there, the victims just see cause and effect. Uh, and then want, want yeah. the, the justice done and, and the issue resolved. Uh, one more point, Chair, if I may, on the the uh, maximum sentencing. Yeah, I, I get frustrated with this a lot because what we believe should be a, a sentence, we, we get this wrong all the time. We all do. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a bit like the speed limit on the road. That's, that's a limit, it's not a target. But we all drive at the speed limit, you know, that way. So, so that's what people expect whenever you're looking at justice being served. And I suspect all the justice agencies, you know, one of the first questions that a victim may ask is, well, what, 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 what do we expect here? And, and they will be told the maximum sentence. No, I, I'm inclined to disagree, actually. I think if the, if the uh, victim would talk to PPS and say, well, by the sentence, the PPS is much more likely to say, well, there's a ra the range, and their experience, given the nature of the offence, the type of uh, the age of the offender, and other mitigating factors, it'll probably, probably be X to Y. Uh, I, I'd be astonished to hear that everybody, people are going along, along and being told, no, the maximum offence is 20 years, you expect that because that isn't the way the system works. And indeed, it shouldn't work that way, because in fact, it's important we give people realistic expectations of what's, what is likely. And I know that public prosecution services have a great deal of experience and knowledge about these things. They, may, they can make, they won't get it right all the time, but they will make very good assessments because of, the, of their extensive experience. So I, wouldn't, so I would say that we do not, it's not like the, you know, driving at speed limit, you, the assumption is everybody goes that, that level. I'm also conscious that one of the things which we did dispel in the course of this review was this notion that uh, England and the Republic of Ireland have radically different and more severe sentences. Our, our research showed actually was relatively little difference in practice. And even where you get those, uh, uh, those um, extraordinary sentences, like the 40 years for that guard um, uh, recently, um, actually, the, the southern system gives them 25% off, off a good behaviour automatically. I brought it down to 30 years. 
the sentence in law 9, the guidelines, for that type of offence would have been the same. So you get headline things which seem to scream out and people say, look, at uh, you know, you only get 10 years here and it's 40 years there. In practical terms, when you compare like with like, uh, Northern Ireland is not that dissimilar. And we have actually in the, the, the minister's recommendation proposal decisions, the minister has, has looked at the, the tariff levels and then increased the bottom tariffs uh, uh, appropriately. And that's very much consistent with what's happening in the other parts of the United Kingdom. So, you know, I think certainly we do have maximum sentences, but in fact, you know, we have a, judge, a, judge ba a judicial based system where independent judges make judgment calls based on the facts. And what we do is we give them the capacity to make the judgment call, that may take the judgment of what constitutes the right sentence. And that could be the maximum. And there are some horrendous offences which do, do, do actually attract the maximum, absolutely. Uh, but in often, often times, there will be a, a mitigating other factors, just as there are aggravating factors which will push it the other way. Okay, thanks for your, your answers. You pray it, uh, provide it confidence and assurance. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Um, Sinead Bradley and then Rachel Woods after Sinead. Sinead. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Um, thank you for your presentation. And I suppose um, I too am going to hone in on the death by dangerous driving. Um, and that's not to negate from the other the other um, offences listed here, but I suppose I do so because, Brian, as you've pointed out and Linda referred to, we did have a meeting with Peter and Neve Dolan um, about the tragic loss of their son and uh, who, who seemed to be such a lovely boy and um, taken so young. And during that meeting, um, and once I read the papers from the committee and that, it's... I can see how, you know, they've been relentless campaigners and they've obviously influenced, there's no doubt they've influenced the work at the, at the um, department and they've certainly influenced my thinking on, on this whole issue because, you know, when they talked about um, the need to eliminate those unduly lenient sentences, I suppose rather than my focus, I could see why to do that we'd have to shift the maximum sentencing, but really the truth lies in the minimum. Um, you know, what, what is the minimum sentencing under such circumstances? And, and I won't rehearse, a lot has been covered in terms of what I wanted to raise, but I suppose, you know, people like the Dolans who are listening in and really wanting to know when is this going to happen and is it going to have the desired effect that the minimum sentence is is more reflective of the actual um, crime itself but on top of that they also mentioned um things that you know they talked about the whole language of the court system and the judiciary and really using language such as the discount you know it's just so insensitive and it's absolutely inappropriate you know and i i did wonder is this the time um and the legislative vehicle to review all of that and say that that's not that's not it. it i can understand how maybe over time it's it's just become understood for its meaning but language over time can change and the sensitivities around it and when you face the loss of a young son like um the dolans unfortunately had to it's really difficult to hear that type of language being used and i i just think we need um to be more sensitive than that. So there, you talked there, um, Brian, about the whole refining of this work, and I suppose I want to know in the refining of it, um, how confident do you feel that it will happen and it will have the desired effect from campaigners like the Dolans to say that the, the minimum up to the maximum will reflect um, more accurately the extreme situation that they had to that they had to face, and that it would be done in a more sensitive manner. Thank you. Okay, you raised a number of points, Sinead. I, <clears throat> like you, I've I've met uh, Peter Dolan and the family, and indeed a number of other families on a number of occasions. This work has progressed, and I know certainly the minister had a very good meeting with them actually when she made her decisions about this. And I, I my sense was the family were broadly content, though you know obviously. They may still have some issues which they, they have concerns about. Um, there isn't, as there isn't indeed, the, 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 there isn't a minimum sentence for anything or for very few things in in, um, in law. 
Um, and by and large, we've steered away, the, the review steered away from trying to say minimum sentencing, because ultimately you set, the judge is there to make the judgment call what constitutes the appropriate sentence. The maximum, actually, I think, is a clear message about the, sever the, the severity of the crime at its most severe state. Um, and indeed, that could even sometimes be added to with, with, with other factors, uh, like aggravating factors or whatever. But um, essentially, we don't set a minimum as such, but certainly where the, the uh, sentence maximum is increased, uh, our ex strong expectation is that judges actually take account of that when they're looking at actually what constitutes the right sentence. So a so, uh, consequence of that will be the average sentence will actually increase proportionally. Uh, and of course, if a judge was to give a very low sentence in this sort of case, they would, I, I would say they would, I would expect them normally to explain just why that is the case. And of course, if it was, if you like, it seemed to be off the wall, uh, there, there certainly would be opportunity in that sort of case to go for a, to um, approach to PPS about actually an unduly, unduly lenient sentence. And they would look at that, and if it was deemed to be, that, to be so lenient, uh, that, could, that could result in... Um, and uh, a, a change. And the, that does happen. It's not, it's not a big event, but I think judges normally are fairly, are fairly clear. They follow guidelines in many cases, and they're very experienced. So we don't see those sort of things happening too often, but they do happen uh, every year. We have a small number of cases where they are actually uh, increased, sometimes quite significantly. But uh, that's quite the exception normally, because the judges actually are very experienced. Um, on the language, I don't believe that the best will in the world, I, you, I could write or we could write legislation to control language. But I think this is about actually perhaps how we, this is back to, I think, the point which was being made earlier by Linda about actually education. If uh, part of the education is obviously the judicial ed education, and certainly the, the, um, um, that that would be part of, you know, going forward, when future, any new legislation like this, certainly it will be, rolled out and certainly the Judicial Studies Board would be giving sessions with, their, their, with the judges about their, what the consequences are and certainly where there are issues raised about language, certainly with both we can raise those uh, with, with them. It's not a matter for legislation, but I think you're quite right, you know, in sensitivity, sometimes lawyers actually for, for, um, find it easy to speak uh, legalese, uh, which in fact may speed up their processes, but in fact sometimes um, just leave, leave victims and others behind. I think that's an important awareness, which I, I believe actually judges are, are better at now than they would have been 10 or 15 years ago. But there's probably still room for actually making these, their decisions clearer. And I know certainly in some of the cases I've been involved in where judges have given very detailed explanations of their judgment and what the fact is concerned and how they've dealt with this. In the main, those have been very sensitive. But in fact, you're right, there are some words which actually may jar because they have a technical use, uh, which is uh, perhaps different from um, what the public would expect. So that's, but that's one that could be picked up uh, both through the Judicial Studies Board, but also actually does actually conversations uh, in, the, in the light of the review. And when you're asking me what, what guarantees can I give that this will happen, uh, what I can say is in fact the Department and the Minister have invested a great deal of time into this, We've brought the, 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 um, that review to this committee, and indeed, um, we've already trailed some elements of it, like the, um, the, the death by data driving. Uh, and the minister's decisions, my sense was from the media feedback, was fairly positive. And I know that Dolans may well still have issues, but at the same time, I think they are happy we're moving significantly in the right direction. Um, so I think, given that, uh, if you like, that. Uh, uh, that groundswell of, I think, broad support for the approach. And I, I get, today, I haven't had a strong sense from this committee uh, of any particular concern, uh, significant concerns or worries about the review. I'm conscious, in fact, when we go for legislation, the, the committee will have ample opportunity to go through this clause by clause and test uh, the thinking in, in each element and uh, no doubt help us to improve it. And that's, that's part of the process. But certainly... Uh, my sense is, in fact, this is a, a solid body of work. It's, it's been received, as far as I can see, reasonably, uh, reasonably well. I think certainly politically, uh, it's also in the public domain. Uh, it would be, I would have thought, um, surprising if a future minister of whatever hue was to decide to set this aside, when in fact um, it is evidence-based. 
you know, it's built on good practice, it's looked at good practice elsewhere in developing the proposals. The proposals are, I think, fairly proportionate. They're actually, in some cases, consolidating the best practice. In other cases, actually moving on, taking account of victims' concerns. Uh, I, I'd have thought it would be very surprising if the minister was to set their, uh, set their face against that sort of approach. And certainly in terms of actually making it happen, the minister has made a commitment that, in fact, um, once, this is, once this is produced, as her decisions are made, that my, my, t my team will actually start working on turning this into, an, into this sort of instructions. So if my expectation is that as the year progresses, and um, I'm conscious that Angela and Myra have a number of other responsibilities, but as some of those things dissipate, uh, we will actually put more and more resource as we go towards the end of the mandate into actually starting to draft instructions and, and preparing this. So my hope would be by the end of the mandate, we will be in quite a good place to actually launch this into a bill relatively early in the next mandate. Um, so I can give no guarantees, but what I can say is I'd be astonished if actually a good piece of work, evidence-based, delivering actually significant uh, pro um, positive developments in the, the sentencing process was to be set aside um, without good reason. And I'm struggling to think what a good reason would be. Um, so in terms of desired effects, I think, in fact, um, by and large, what did that, the review has done is produce a number of very good and positive recommendations which will improve and qualify and uh, materially actually change some of the ways we work and for the good and we'll also do things like setting the whole sensing uh, process into a, a coherent framework and actually also sort of doing some positive work on the community sentencing and certainly uh, improving the public's perception and understanding of sentencing all those things sound like very positive outcomes and I'd be surprised if a future minister wouldn't want to, to, to sign up to them. Thank you, and thank you, Chair. I, I do appreciate that being on the record and that commitment to it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sinead. Rachel? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for all that. There's been a number of issues covered so far, so I'm not going to go over them. Um, but just bringing back to the purposes and principles, which is an issue that the chair had raised at the start and in terms in relation to changing in line, sort of say with other jurisdictions um, and putting the purposes and principles within primary legislation to enable and help with understanding of sentencing. Um, but looking at other jurisdictions, has has that helped? Has that been measured? Has, you know, if, if they're putting it in primary legislation, has that actually helped with understanding of sentencing um, and I suppose to a wider point and it was picked up earlier on when Linda Dillon had mentioned it with regard to an education piece um, something that I am extremely passionate is about, about is, is, the, is the importance of education and this is not just educating people on driving offences but this is about education of the criminal justice system and the justice system in general we don't get taught about it and you know, people don't understand what the, the justice system is about. It's incredibly complex. It's incredibly confusing for even people who operate in it. It's not talked about and it's only often, as we've, we've heard earlier on, when cases make headlines within the media, do people start having conversations about it and they might not be using the correct information or have access to the correct information. Um, so, or else if, if something goes wrong in their life and they come into contact with the justice system. So I'm just wondering if the department has considered that as a body of work alongside um, everything else that's been outlined in our agenda and our pack today as, as part of a, a wider societal understanding of the justice system, including sentencing guidelines. Um, so that, that's my first point and I have another two just on specifics. Um, if you want to take that one first, apologies. Quite a lot there. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I think we did find. I'll let, I'll let Andrew. You, do you want to pick up the first bit about um, uh, practices and principles? Actually, how actually oh, principles and purposes, and how actually we were influenced by others. But before you do that, I would just would say, you know, that part of our, any of this sort of pro process is actually in, the, in this policy development area is to look to how others do. I'm very, we're very happy to steal good ideas. If nothing else, what it does when you look at other people's uh, approaches actually gives you actually a broader understanding of some of the issues we should be addressing. Anyway, sorry, I've taken the answer away from you, Angela. Mm. Before you go. It's okay. Um, in terms of the purposes and principles, uh, I suppose our nearest comparator would be England and Wales, where they were set in legislation in 2003. 
Um, and that was on the basis that, for the same reason we are now proposing, that we should add them into legislation to increase clarity and understanding of the sentencing process. That was part of a, a very large package of sentencing reform then. Um, and really, I suppose it was on the basis of that that we included consultation on the purposes and principles in our consultation now. Um, and we found a, a good deal of support from our consultee respondents to having a very clear definition. Um, so it's a difficult thing to actually assess in any sort of numerical way how such a, a statement changes people's perceptions. Um, but certainly it was seen as a positive and certainly something that having consulted on, we've, we've had a good deal of support in having the clarity um, and including in legislation so that there is that understanding across across the piece. Okay, thank you. So I suppose it's just the, in terms of yes, England have done it and it's been in, but has it had any tangible benefits? Um, I appreciate in terms of numerical um, your data collection and, and researching, you know, might not get in that kind of um, data specific, you know, you're not going to get sort of a tick box or anything like that. But if there is a, if there's sort of a wider, a wider societal benefit, then I completely understand it. It just does that need to go into primary legislation or is it part in part then the need to educate and have clear and easily digestible um, understanding available for the public and, and anybody is operating in it of what's going on and what sentencing is about? Well, again, it, it does give a very sound background for the sentencing framework to then be built upon. Um, and for example, the, the inclusion of rehabilitation and reparation, it, it allows the system to then uh, allocate importance to those principles and purposes and therefore take forward development of work in, in the types of community sentencing we're now seeing coming forward and the, the, the smarter approach to justice which has be, has sort of developed a, a head of steam over the last few years and become much more um, I suppose a better understanding that sort of treating the, the root causes of sentencing of offend, offending will in the long run have a better outcome so I think that there is that positive benefit from it that we can see. You talked about ed the education front <laughs> to be honest actually having the uh, purposes and principles of, of um, sentencing as a core of actually a, a sentencing bill uh, when you come into education actually so that actually provides quite a good basis because in fact you start off why you <laughs> why you have sentences you know, and it's um, it's not just, you know, the um, man in the, in, in the, in the shank of the omnibus uh, might well just say, well, it's for punishment. And then, then uh, how would it work? You know, and I say it should be fair, proportionate and transparent. That, uh, that actually has some, some calls in the justice system. Because sometimes I think, you know, if, you had a, if we have some failings, sometimes we're not transparent enough. Now, you can understand why we're dealing with complex law. But at the same time, it's also got to be accessible law from the man in the street. So having those principles in at the, at the beginning and then recognising punish, that um, punishment is an important component of sentencing. It's not the only one. It's also about rehabilitation. It's about deterrence. It's about reparation. It's about, you know, it's not, uh, there are a number of factors, all of which actually sort of have to be taken into account. And getting a broader understanding of that is actually important. And if we're going to, you know, I've been to this committee a few times recently. Each time we talk about education, and I've said the same thing every time. Absolutely, we we need to actually get the public in a better place to understand the law and its implications for them. And with that understanding, we should create greater confidence. So, um, a sentencing bill would have to come coming with a sentencing bill would have to be a, a campaign for actually looking at how we actually improve that that uh, understanding. Just as when you look at stalking or some of the other things, some, uh, some of the Gillen recommendations, uh, which will be um, come, dropping into the um, miscellaneous provisions bill, those are all about actually increasing public understanding about what you mean by consent and what do you, and uh, what, what constitutes appropriate behaviour. So we are having, I think, a certain convergence of ideas coming forward. So I think there is a big piece of work for us to do in the next mandate, just about actually sort of making this, uh, justice more 
uh, accessible to individuals. Because most people only see the justice system when something goes wrong, and in most cases, that's very, very rarely in your lifetimes. Many people have never been in a court, and then something terrible happens, and then actually you know, they, they um, don't know where they understand what's going on. They don't appreciate the subtleties that maybe the people around this table would, would appreciate. So, um, so I think there is a big a bit of edu education there, and I think we need to do it in a coherent way. The sensing has to be part of that, but at the same time, it's also about, um, again, we said in the, in the review, it's also about on the things like community sentencing, where it's, people, it's very easy to say, oh, it's just a, a, an easy way out. So strange enough, if you talk to actually offenders, they would tell you actually, <laughs> they sometimes actually rather prefer to go to prison than actually sort of uh, uh, be actually sort of uh, under, under sort of um, under obligations in the community. But the reality is, you know, in the areas like that, we need to increase public understanding and awareness because sometimes actually there's public misperceptions or misunderstandings actually sort of uh, do a disservice to the justice system and, and to victims and offenders. Thank you, Brian. No, I could talk about the importance of education and educating children and young people and, and adults um, and uh, anybody really on, 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 any, on anything that we've covered here. But um, I could talk all day about it, so I won't. But there are two just specific issues, um, and you'd raised community sentencing before. Um, but there are two key issues that appear sort of to lack a kind of plan within this. And I and forgive me if I'm missing it in the briefing, but on community sentencing and also sentencing for hate crime. So um, just if it would be useful to elaborate on sort of what further work is intended to be done on these two areas, and with regard to community sentencing, the proposed way forward is. The um, ministers agreed that further modelling work with the assistance of a key stakeholder working group should be carried out before definite commitments to introduce any options are given. So just wondering if that work has started, what will it look at, you know, who who's going to be on this um, working group and are, is there any intention of consulting and learning for international examples, for, uh, for example? Um, and then also about diversionary type community intervention options um, for appropriate minor first time offences for adults. Um, again, any dedicated work starting on this and we, is that seen as part of the adult restorative justice strategy that we uh, committee got briefed on a while ago? Um, and again, who's involved and when could we expect to see something or have any input onto that work? Um, and finally, Chair, just my last question is in terms of sentencing for hate crime. Um, on the way forward, and it's noting that the review team will work with the DOJ colleagues uh, dealing with Judge Marinin's review in respect of this. Um, so obviously there have been noted there about direct overlaps in work. Um, so how would that occur, and is there a risk that anything would be missed here in the approach on that issue? Well, well I'll start off and I'll pass you over to Angela. Um, <clears throat> the, when it comes to the um, community sentencing, um, I suppose it's probably best to recognise that although this review has taken a while, and you'll have seen from what you've, the papers we gave you, we've covered a, a really enormous area. And to say we can, get, we can actually find answers and everything in one, one exercise uh, was perhaps a little, um, you know, uh, what we've done is we've tried to make the place, leave the place better than we've found it, but at the same time we're on a journey in some of these things. And certainly when it came to the community sentencing, we did actually look internationally, and we did have some, some quite useful ideas, but then the, the, the issue became, became just actually where we were producing and suggesting a number of options, but some of them were not that dis, distance one from another. Some actually had some over, overlaps, and talking to some of, some of the um, justice agencies and whatever, just trying to back the workability and how we can make sure people have a good understanding of what's, what's happening. We felt we needed more, to do more work on this, so in fact we could actually get some greater differentiation. Um, because what we want to do is actually have a system which is actually people understand, where we've got clear, um, clear lines. And we're looking, to be honest, we're moving away from the one-size-fits-all model towards a much more bespoke model, where you're trying to actually look at the actual needs of the offender in, or the def deficiencies in the offender to try to actually bring them to a place where they can cease to offend and actually live a nor as a normal citizen. Um, so we recognise you need a number of different factors, a number of different potential uh, issue, um, tools to do that. Um, but in the work we did, we, we came to the conclusion, talking to probation and others, that you know, we, there was still more work to do on that. And um, so rather than actually, we didn't want to hold the review up 
Uh, but at the same time, in that area, clearly we recognise there was more to do. And actually, we want to, again, we want to get this right. Um, we're quite clear we need to improve the public awareness of about this, the value of, of community sensing. But at the same time, there are additional options which we need to do a bit more work on. And on the hate crime side, we're very conscious of that, um, whereas we're absolutely clear that you know, hate crime it needs to be addressed and actually it needs to be an aggravating factor. Clearly, the, um, behind us, um, the hate crime review started. We, uh, we had um, 20, uh, 20 or 30 re um, responses in our consultation to hate crime. Uh, they've had 270, whatever. Clearly, they've had a more focused review. Um, so what we wanted to do was work with them. So clearly, the, the principles and, um, and, and um, uh, pur purpose and principles of sentencing that will actually influence that, our input to that work. Um, so, but there'll be an interlinkage. And of course, in justice, many issues overlap and interlink. Um, similarly, on the hate crime front, you know, we looked at uh, crimes against older people and we were very clear, indeed talking to some of the older people organisations, that we didn't need offences against older people, but we did have to recognise where it was about vulnerable people and where people were being targeted, singled out because of their vulnerability, then that was, had to be an aggravating factor. So, you know, in some ways, it was about changing the language. So, in fact, we had it better focused on, on the area. So, in that sort of area, too, we will be working, uh, my, some of my team will work with the hate crime review uh, implementation team so we can factor what we are thinking into their thinking to actually produce the, the right product. Sorry, Andrew, I, I, probably, I may well have covered a lot of the ground on, on, on the community side. Did you want to say anything else on that? Um, just in relation to the working group, we have already had an early meeting, um, which we invited as many people as we could think would have an interest, so it would have as wide a, an input as possible. Um, so we understand that we will need to uh, work with health, certainly as one of our... Um, partners, um, probation, police, PPS, we had some voluntary bodies as well, including uh, NIACRO and victim support, and we were um, hoping to have input from extern as well. We understand that for some of those smaller or um, lower level community options that we were suggesting, it would be quite an administrative burden, um, but at the same time, there is requirement for a statutory body to be there in the event of non-compliance or to ensure compliance. So we need to work through those issues, how that's going to work and how we can use perhaps non-voluntary or non-statutory bodies to help um, ro roll those out. Uh, and as Brian was saying, to make a significant distinction between the new suggestions and the existing um, orders that we have so there's an understanding and, and we don't get into a situ situation where we just have confusion over the, the various, very, very similar types of disposals. Um, the diversionary adult suggestion was one police were very supportive of, but they do have a number of existing uh, diversionary type things that they can do, community resolutions, formal warnings, cautions, um, penalty notices. And again, it's, it's finding where this would fit within that existing structure. Um, because our, our hope was that we would have something that would not incur any kind of a criminal record, uh, but at the same time would include some kind of uh, restorative reparative program. Um, and again, it's, it's just trying to get that the level right so that uh, something that seems lower doesn't end up with a criminal record, and yet that you know something else does. So a bit of work to be done with this, but but a lot of support for us to continue the work. Um, on the hate crime, as again Brian has said, Judge Marin's uh, review was much more extensive than ours. It looked at the whole hate crime legislation, whereas we just looked at sentencing. And some of his questions really overlapped quite significantly with our questions. So it seemed a number of our respondents actually said would prefer to respond to the independent review because there, there are such similarities. Um, so we. We think it, it, is, it make, makes more sense really to, to have a combined approach and make sure that we address the same things, which it looks very uh, much like we will be covering the same ground. And as far as that works, being, uh, continuing officials have been analysing the recommendations of that report uh, with a few developing a uh, departmental response and reporting to the committee in due course. Um, there will be again some recommendations that will not require legislation, some that will, 
and so it may be that there's further uh, work for a, another a hate crime piece of legislation in the next mandate coming forward from the independent review, which we would we would hope to feed into. Thank you, Chair. All right. Thank you for your answer. Thank you, Rachel. And just Linda's wanting then, I think, on a final quick point, and then we'll wrap it up. Thank you, and apologies. Can, can I just ask a very quick question in relation to the minimum sentence on, on murder? What is the rationale behind that, and what evidence is there to, be, to back it up? Uh, Myra, do you want to, Myra, you, um, Myra shared my, legal, one of my legal advisors did a lot of the work on them, but so Myra, do you want to pick that one up? So I'm constantly, I haven't really brought you into this. Um, yeah, that's fine, Brian. Um, well, I'm, uh, there's, a, there's only mandatory sentence for murder, and that's life. There, the, that, that is the only sentence for murder. I think perhaps the question is then dictated towards um, the tariff that then is um, awarded by a judge. Um, depending on the tariff, um, again, uh, doesn't necessarily have a minimum other than that which is by established in case law guideline cases. Um, but what you do have is two currently common law starting points, um, the lower starting point which currently is 12 and the higher starting point which is 15 or 16. So, oh, Jesus, starting point. You're right. Yeah, no, no, no. That's, it's, it's a common <laughs> um, issue that arises. Um, but I suppose we, what the review has done, um, or proposes to the Justice Committee and proposed to the Minister, is that we would build on the existing case law approach, but that we reflected the feedback that we got. Um, on the adequacy, of, as it was perceived, of the current starting points. Um, there was also um, a, a number of people who wished to see aggravating factors reflected in legislation so that they would be clarity and transparency about it. But there are many that are already established in case law. Um, so our view was that we would follow the current approach of what there is, but reflect the concerns by um, increasing the two start, start, start starting points. Because England and Wales' lowest one is 12 as well, but it's for those under the age of 21, um, where they don't have any aggravating features. Um, so that is what kind of governed the approach um, and is still retaining the judicial discretion to then to take in and reflect both all the aggravating features and any mitigating features that may be presented to the court at trial. Um, clearly that, that a tariff can go well beyond the starting points. Um, and indeed, even the current law, which call what they call serious um, exculpatory um, murder, can be up to 30 years. And that's where the guideline cases obviously have ended up for the murder of police in this jurisdiction um, uh, as well. Does, does that Thank you, Chair. Yeah, 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 it does. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. Um, all right, Marie, Angela and Brian, thank you very much for, for coming to the committee today. Much appreciated. Thank you. No pleasure. Okay, members, a number of you just mentioned um, in the course of that the meeting that we had with Mr and Mrs Dolan, so just um, to put that on the record, um, there was an informal meeting on uh, Tuesday of this week um, with Mr and Mrs Dolan and they lost their son in tragic circumstances um, and that was to discuss then the Justice Minister's decision to increase the maximum tariffs for causing death or grievous bodily injury by dangerous driving and causing death or grievous uh, bodily injury by careless driving. So note of that meeting is being prepared and circulated to all committee members. During that meeting, Mr and Mrs Dolan did ask the committee to support the increase in maximum sentence from 14 to 20 years and the increase in mandatory disqualification periods and also to write to the Executive and Department of Justice advising them accordingly. They also asked the committee to explore whether there is any opportunity to bring forward the required legislation before the end of this mandate, and if not, to request then a timeline and roadmap from officials to ensure 
necessary preparatory work is progressed as swiftly as possible so that the legislation can be brought forward as early as possible in the new uh, mandate. Uh, so, members, I I'm hoping we can get an agreed committee position um, in respect of the proposed changes uh, for that uh, particular offence. It was one of the requests that was asked for in that meeting. And if members are content to support the proposals relating uh, to death by dangerous driving offences, then we will write to the Minister of Justice and the Executive to advise them of the committee's position and indicate that the committee would like to see the necessary preparatory work progressed as swiftly as possible in order that the required legislation can be brought forward as early as possible in the new mandate if there isn't an opportunity to do so in the remaining time frame of uh, this mandate. So are, are members agreed to that um, committee position to be articulated uh, to the Justice Committee or to the Justice Minister and the Executive Office in the first instance? And let me bring in Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, just to go on record to thank the Dolans, and without without any hesitation, I would be in agreement with that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, and um, Linda Dillon. Sorry, Linda, that's you in the spotlight. Sorry, uh, no problem. Um, thank you, Chair. Just uh, again to. Like she needed to place on the record that absolutely we would be willing to support that as a committee position. Okay, thank you, Linda. Uh, and for completeness sake, um, I think Rachel is there, and then I'll come to Doug. Thanks, Chair. Yes, and apologies, I was very late to the meeting on Tuesday um, and caught the tail end of it, but um, no, no issues with the committee position. And just thank uh, the Dolans for meeting with us. I think it was a very from. What it did catch was a very powerful meeting, um, and I look forward to the note um, that we circulated. And again, apologies that I was only able to get to the tail end of it. I was in plenary, um, but thank you for facilitating that meeting as well. Okay, no problem. And then, if Doug is still there, I'll come to Doug. Yeah, I'm still. I'm still here. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, absolutely, I, I missed a meeting, and apologies for missing the meeting. Uh, but without a shadow of a doubt, I'm 100% in uh, support of. Uh, of this, uh, as per what uh, Linda has just said. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, listen, uh, members, it was an informal meeting. It wasn't a formal meeting of the committee, so no one was under, in that respect, any obligation um, to be there. So there's no issues uh, about that. The purpose of those informal meetings recognises not everyone can go, but we at least formalise then that when we come to this committee today and provide a record of that meeting. So that's just what we're doing at this stage. Well, we will. Um, formally then write to the Justice Minister and the Executive in respect of this issue of the dangerous driving offences. Um, uh, and we will also uh, write to Mr and Mrs Dolan, updating them on the committee position that we have taken in respect of that. Obviously, um, there has been a bit of commentary just about um, the, the timeline and so on, and we will just incorporate that in the letter um, from the Minister for Justice that we would have a preference for this mandate, but obviously um, if that isn't going to be possible, then it's as early as possible, and ask for them just to indicate: um, you know, is that something that could be incorporated in the miscellaneous justice bill? Um, but obviously, we've heard the arguments being presented by officials today, which which are compelling. But nevertheless, I think we should ask, as a committee on behalf of the Dolan family, um, that question. And if members are agreeable, we'll incorporate that then into um, the letter. Okay. Um, in terms of then the the more general um, part of the, the briefing session, obviously that is going to be brought forward through the normal legislative processes, and the committee will consider it in due course, and indeed probably in the next uh, mandate. So unless there is any further points that members are wanting to make, we will note the, the um, presentation and the proposals that have been brought forward by the department, and we will engage with them as they emerge. Um, out of the department in whatever format that they're going to come through, if members are agreeable to that. Okay, then the final item is um, the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service, a business recovery update, and uh, officials are going to be attending the meeting. So, um, just as um, Peter's taking his seat, um, the relevant papers members are pages 
um, 773 through to 806 of the meeting pack. Um, we have pushed back the, well, we haven't, but the executive has pushed back the ad hoc committee meeting to five o'clock now. So um, hopefully that's a sign of further progress being made on these restrictions. Um, but nevertheless, that, that ad hoc committee meeting is now taking place at uh, five o'clock. So can I formally welcome um, Peter Lunny, Chief Operating Officer, and Elaine Topping, Head of um, Court Operations of the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service, to the meeting. You're both very welcome. We'll record the session by Hansard. We'll publish a transcript on the web page in due course. So I think, Peter, I'm going to hand over to you at this stage. Fine. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and, and, and good afternoon to everybody who's here and on the, the link. Um, we're pleased to be able to brief the Committee on the Courts and Tribunal Services' response to the COVID-19 pandemic over the course of the past 12 months. Uh, the steps that we've taken to support the recovery of court and tribunal business, taking account of the prevailing health guidance and, and plans as we start to emerge from the latest set of restrictions. When I last attended the Committee on the 20th of May, I provided an update on the immediate impact of the pandemic on courts and tribunals. I advised the Committee of the challenges we faced, taking account of the prevailing health guidance and social distancing requirements, and I informed the Committee of the increased use of technology in courts and, and tribunals, noting plans at that stage to hold the first physical case in the Court of Appeal and arrangements to support jury trials. During the last 12 months, our main focus has been managing the impact of COVID uh, uh, on the courts and tribunals. As with most walks of life, this has been uh, an unprecedented challenge, uh, unlike any previously faced, and combined with the pace at which it unfolded, resulted in quite fundamental changes to long-established procedures and ways of working. In response, NICTS developed a graduated approach to the public health emergency, working with the judiciary, partner organisations and other stakeholders to initially slow down lower priority areas and consolidate business into five operational court hubs. We work closely with the Office of the Lord Chief Justice on practical arrangements to reduce the need for attendance at court, including the adjournment of cases administratively, dispensing with the requirement for parties to attend other than in specified circumstances, making greater use of technology to facilitate the move from traditional face-to-face -face hearings, uh, which uh, was the overwhelming default position in the justice system prior to the pandemic, to remote hearings supported by video technology on a scale not previously seen. As plans were developed to begin the recovery of court business, it was clear that the size, layout and condition of the court estate presented specific challenges, most noticeably in terms of Crown Court business because of its complexity. A small team was established to take forward a review of the estate, prepare revised floor plans, complete COVID-19 secure risk assessments and implement a range of work within tightly defined timelines to support uh, the start of the Michaelmas term in September. There was extensive consultation with the judiciary, justice system partners, the public health agency and trade union representatives in order to provide a safe and secure environment for staff, judiciary and court users. Recognising the impact on victims and witnesses in particular, we have been working closely with victim support and NSPCC as we seek to balance their needs with the other accommodation pressures arising from the pandemic. Robust social distancing measures were introduced into courtrooms, offices and public areas, as well as enhanced cleaning regimes and clear guidance for court users. Technology was deployed for remote and hybrid hearings. Courtrooms were reconfigured with glass and perspex screens erected to allow proceedings to take place safely. Hand, sanita hand sanitation stations and social distance signage uh, were installed throughout the NICTS estate, with court users provided with instruction on issues such as face coverings and when they should or should not attend court in person. Public safety has been and remains a priority for NICTS, the judiciary and our justice partners, and we have worked hard to ensure court and tribunal proceedings can be conducted safely. Through the work completed by our teams and in collaboration with the Office of the Lord Chief Justice and partners, courts and tribunal business continued throughout the pandemic, albeit in certain areas at reduced levels. Key business recovery achievements include all courthouses, with the exception of the three smallest hearing centres, have reopened. Uh, the fact that the uh, Limavady, Macrofelt and Straban business, uh, venues remain shut is due to physical factors, such as the size of these venues and the absence of mechanical ventilation. Virtual courtroom capacity has been significantly increased, with video conferencing te technology being deployed to facilitate remote and hybrid hearings. There are now 66 site link licences and 17 WebEx in operation across the court estate. 
In total, 27 additional video conferencing units have been installed in courtrooms and tribunal hearing rooms to facilitate virtual and hybrid hearings. Working throughout the summer, we carried out substantial construction works to modify eight courtrooms across Northern Ireland to allow Crown Court jury trials to recommence in a COVID-secure environment. Two more jury courtrooms were made available in Belfast in March, and with the completion of modification works in Antrim, Dungannon and Newry in the next week or so, there will be a total of 13 jury uh, trial courtrooms available, exceeding capacity uh, for the average number of trials held at any one time pre-COVID. Agreement on a leasing arrangement for the International Conference Centre in Belfast as the Nightingale venue to support NICTS operations. Uh, the ICC was initially, li initially limited to providing accommodation for jury impanelment and back office staff. However, use of the facility has been extended uh, to include coroner's business, a pre-hearing space uh, for solicitors and clients to consult and wait. In addition, tribunal business such as welfare appeals is currently being listed. Uh, and it is proposed to shortly commence the listing of small claims business in, uh, in, in the ICC also. I'd like to acknowledge the remarkable progress we've made so far in restoring court business, uh, court and tribunal services. While there is still some way to go to return to pre-pandemic business levels, there has been a concerted effort from staff, judiciary and our justice system partners to ensure uh, courts and tribunals continue to operate throughout the pandemic. Magistrates' courts uh, typically have an active criminal caseload of just over 8,000 cases. As a result of the pandemic and the consolidation of the business into the five hubs, this rose to a peak of uh, 12,800 cases in September. However, the reopening of court venues and working collaboratively with the judiciary uh, and justice partners to adopt uh, to new ways of working has allowed us to recover this to just over 10,000 cases in February. The position in relation to Crown Court business is much more challenging given the reduced court capacity and the prohibition on jurors attending virtually. Data confirms that uh, more cases are being received than dealt with and consequently the backlog continues to increase, albeit slowly. The recent increase in jury courtrooms from 8 to 13 will allow us to tackle this and we are working to identify and implement two more jury courtrooms for September. This is a priority for us and our partners as we move forward in, in the new business, into the new business year. It is not possible to accurately determine the overall backlog of cases for civil business in exactly the same manner as it is for criminal. Civil cases lodged in court uh, may be inactive for several reasons, including negotiations between the parties, solicitors not informing the court office that cases have been settled, or because parties simply decide not to proceed with a case. Currently, county court receipts and disposals are just over 60% of their pre-lockdown numbers. We anticipate that work in this area will increase in the coming months as the public health message changes, restrictions ease and best practice guidance relating to matters such as eviction and ejectment are reviewed. In terms of family court business, both receipts and disposals declined at the start of the lockdown. However, the dip in receipts was less marked than, uh, than seen in criminal and civil business. From mid-April, cases received and disposed have steadily increased, uh, and with the reopening of most courts in August, the average number of receipts and disposals increased further, currently exceeding pre-lockdown levels by around 10 per cent. This is an area in which hybrid and remote hearings have worked to good effect, although we would acknowledge that the length and complexity of specific proceedings can make the use of live links challenging. Finally, in relation to tribunals, uh, tribunals have con continued to sit largely through a combination of remote and office-based working arrangements. This has helped to ensure continuity of essential services through revised administrative processes and the use of video and audio technology with the support of our judiciary and our stakeholders. In response to the current lockdown restrictions, the President uh, of the Appeals Tribunal, which deals with benefits appeals, took the decision to suspend all face-to-face -face hearings from the 26th of December subject to review on a four-weekly basis. Alternative hearing options such as paper-based hearings, teleconferences and live television links continued through this period. Face-to-face -face or oral hearings resumed on a phased basis uh, on the 7th of April, with cases listed in the ICC and a range of regional centres from the 19th of April. The impact of the pandemic and the effort to recover the work of the courts and tribunals will remain the, the main focus for the new business year. Uh, performance continues to be monitored closely, and we will monitor. Uh, we will continue to work with the judiciary and our partners to review uh, the supporting business processes, taking account of public health guidance as the year progresses. I'm happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you, Peter. And you have went through that very comprehensively.
um, and in terms of asking a range of questions that I had planned, uh, we have covered uh, most of them, I suppose, just picking up on the general. The backlog um, still increasing, albeit at a slow pace, so you've identified a couple of measures that are going to, to, to hopefully stem that. But what fundamentally needs to change for you to really start seeing a big impact that that backlog can get back to kind of pre-COVID? Is it purely to do with the estate virtual or are, are you if you didn't have two metre social distancing, for example, is that the game changer? Of the issues that are within our control, it is capacity of the court estate. So the, the Crown Court backlog, uh, again, should start to be addressed already, now that we have the 13 courts available, uh, and even more quickly when we get up to the 15 courts. But it is the social distancing issue. I mean, at, at two metres or one metre plus mitigation, or one and a half metres plus mitigations, there are still significant constraints on our capacity. Um, we have tried to use the waterfront hall to feed people in because in-person hearings do tend to be more effective than, than virtual hearings, particularly for, for more complex proceedings. Um, but, but that's not a, a facility that we can replicate uh, to all our court buildings. If, for example, uh, the social distancing came down to the World Health Organization's one metre, that would make a substantial difference to us. Yeah. Um, and, and hopefully we, we will get there sooner um, rather than later. Having went through all of that kind of impact and the uh, change to how you've conducted business and so on, once we get to the point where WHO, one metre, and, and, and let's get to where there's no need for any form of social distancing, uh, ultimately we need to get back to the way that we were. We can't keep keep doing this and the new norm. Um, but when we get back to, to their not needing social distancing requirements, what measures that you've had to adapt to will you want to keep that will then really see you know, a transformative change in, in business? Have we got now the makings of a new way of doing business? Uh, we do. We, uh, I, I think the pandemic has forced us to accelerate some of the things which we would, we would have done through our modernisation programme, uh, but which might have taken an, an awful lot more engagement and, and persuasion. Uh, I, I think that we have seen that, that we can use live links to good effect, uh, and, and I would like to, although they are in the COVID legislation and therefore are temporary, I would like to hold on to them as, as, as we move forward into the new normal. Um, we've also made some uh, impact with uh, greater use of, of electronic bundles. One of the, the greatest constraints that we faced uh, has been our reliance on paper. Um, tribunals in particular uh, were, were very paper-based, but have been using things like Office 365, or e-judiciary as it's called, um, to share papers with, with panel members. Uh, that I think we need to build on. The, the um, digital aspect of our modernisation programme is working with a judicial committee uh, chaired by Mr Justice Horner, <clears throat> and they, between now and June, will be piloting the use of e-bundles, I think, in nine different sets of proceedings. That's, that's where we would need to do if, if, if we were going back to the start of the pandemic now, that's the one thing that we were missing that would have allowed us to respond even more quickly. Okay. Okay. No, that, that's, that's all very helpful. And I'm reassured with the responses that you've given. I know throughout this you have sought to minimise the impact, um, but the outworkings of it now as we get into a new way of doing business, I'm hoping this has been a catalyst for that kind of transformation. Um, so thank you for that. Let me bring in some members just at this stage. So Linda Dillon. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Peter and, and Lane. Just a, a couple of questions. Um, you talked about the increase, obviously, in the number of jury courtrooms, and that's going to be increased again to 15. I'm just wondering, are you confident around getting jurors for, for all those courtrooms? Because I, I know that I've had a number of people who've come to me who didn't who had been um, requested for jury panels, but because of shielding and different issues. And, I mean, it's always difficult. We know that to get jurors that really represent are representative of right across our society because people don't want to take time off work, particularly those who are self-employed and, and, and issues like that. So that's the first one. Just then, um, is there any assessment of why the increase of, of 10% in terms of the family court cases? I know I would have my own view in that I don't think that the guidance was very clear 
in relation to access continuing and, and continuing as was during the COVID period and that that could continue even even though we had the, the COVID regulations and I have no doubt some people will have used and abused it but I also know that there were many, many who didn't properly understand it and you know, the Minister <clears throat> I did put this to the Minister on a number of occasions and she said the guidance was clear and maybe the guidance is clear when you have a policy and advisors, a team of advisors around you but it, it's not clear to many, many people out there in the public and I, I think we could have been much more clear around that um, I, I'm conscious I don't want to throw too many questions at you in the one go, but the, I just want to check the tribunals. Is well, there's obviously the face to face is has has started again, but is there still the option for remote tribunals? And, and I'm asking that just based on the fact that there may well again be people, particularly around tribunals, because so that potentially there will be ill health there that won't want to attend face-to-face -face assessments for whatever reason. Now, I think the face-to-face, -face, there are many, many people who definitely will want that and, and weren't, wouldn't even do the remote whenever it was an option for them. But um, is the remote still going to be an option going forward and even going forward beyond um, COVID regulations? Uh, okay. Uh, thank, thanks, Linda. In relation to those three questions, in relation to the jurors, um, yes, uh, I, I very much recognise what you're saying about people being nervous about coming along and doing jury service. And hopefully, as society begins to relax the restrictions, that that, that nervousness may ease. Um, we have certainly we have certainly um, made an effort to try and emphasise the measures that we put in place to try and keep jurors COVID secure. Uh, in practical terms, we. We're also trying to make sure that, that where people need to be excused or deferred from jury services, that's happening at an early stage. So we, we have slightly increased the number of people who are being called for each panel uh, to service the, the number of juries that we need. Uh, we're then doing the deferrals and excusals at that stage with the, the, the jury officer. Um, but, but we aren't finding any particular shortfall with those who are actually then ending up in the panels that are being called to service the, the, the juries at a venue for a month. Um, so I think the, the system at the minute seems to be working well, but, but yes, we, we certainly had some correspondence way back at the start about uh, people being nervous about attending for jury service. Yeah, and we yeah. did. We okay, did some customer, appreciate that, Peter. Thank you. We did some feedback as well. We were very conscious of the nervousness. We took some feedback from our initial panels. That was all very positive. I think one concern might be as people return to work, we may face another challenge, which is people may not be so readily available. So <laughs> with it, everything brings a challenge whenever you work with the jury service. Um, but no, it has been very positive to date, um, much to our surprise. Yeah. Thank um, you. In relation to the, the family court cases and, and access continuing, uh, I suppose that brings in a, a number of factors. It's the, um, the, the, the clarity around the, the statutory regulations, which, which is one point that you've raised. Um, I, I, it's also in relation to the compliance with, with the court orders. Uh, and I know that the, the Chief Justice uh, and the Minister at various times both put out the, uh, a message that um, contact orders should continue to be complied with and that COVID restrictions shouldn't be used as, as, a, as an excuse not to comply with them. Um, that's not to say in, that in individual cases there might not have been very genuine concerns that, uh, about moving to a different house during, during the height of the pandemic. But I think the, the, the Chief Justice and the Minister did try and take steps to, to emphasise that, that contact orders where they existed should continue to be, to, to be complied with. I think there was also an issue you, you didn't, maybe that wasn't in your thinking, but there, there was an issue certainly back at the start whenever we were saying that it was urgent business only, um, that, that some people some people interpreted that very restrictively uh, and felt that they okay. couldn't bring cases back to court. Um, we, we, we did, again, try and consistently put out the message that, look, if you fill in a form and say why you think your case is urgent, that will be set in front of a judge. Uh, and if it's, if it's about access or not getting access and the judge wants to have that listed or wants to do an, an administrative review, that will happen. But, but I know that in practice that message maybe got lost a bit of in translation. Yeah, and okay, I thank you, Peter. I appreciate that. I think the Chief um, also issued some guidance for litigants in person, been very mindful of the fact, no, very specific for litig litigants in person, been very mindful of the fact that a lot of family proceedings, people will be representing themselves. But I appreciate it's still very difficult for people to pick up that guidance. But yeah, 
efforts were made, but yeah, lessons to be learned. I think, I think there are. I think there, there, we, we, it's important that we learn. Hopefully, we'll not be doing this again anytime soon. But it is important that we learn these kinds of, of lessons. In relation to the tribunals, yes, I, I would hope that, that going forward we will still have that, that blended model, which allows for face-to-face -face hearings, remote hearings, uh, and uh, paper-based hearings where appropriate. Um, we, we, again, we did some uh, surveys or uh, customer, customer user surveys in relation to the benefits appeals tribunals, and there was a very strong message came through about people feeling more comfortable, more relaxed, uh, giving evidence from their home or from, from outside the hearing room. Uh, obviously, the panel will have a big say in, in what sort of a, a, a hearing they decide is appropriate, um, but I think once we can demonstrate and give them the assurance that the video technology works well, that there, there's no constraints on their ability to assess the credibility of appellants, things like that, I would like to see them really becoming um, a, a, a staple as we move forward. Um, some of the advice sector uh, bodies that support the appellants have also given us very positive feedback, so we'll, we'll be capturing all that and trying to use it to, to, to again, make that our, our approach going forward. I probably should have declared an interest there, obviously, because we do represent people in tribunals and, and I mean, there were some people that absolutely did not want to do it, yep. you know, remotely and, and you would never put them under pressure, but it certainly was beneficial, I have to say, for the representatives. I, I've spent many, many days sitting in the Enterprise Centre in Dungannon and in Dungannon Courthouse for maybe the, the best part of a day because tribunals are running behind. and. It really is such a, a drain on, on, on your time and resource. So it, it certainly is helpful from that point of view. Just one final point, Chair, if you don't mind. And it's just really to make the point. I know obviously the, the report um, outlines the issues that have been raised by those involved in the family courts and the unsuitability of remote hearings. And I actually reached out because I... I was under the illusion that it perhaps would have been helpful, particularly to those who are maybe been repeatedly dragged back to court and were having to spend full days, same kind of thing, full days hanging about a courthouse and using up, for, for those who are working, using up holidays and, and having to take on paid leave and things like that for people who are on, already under stress. But actually, they said no, that this is a massive, massive thing in their lives. Their children are the most important thing and most important people in their lives. And they felt that having that face to face with a judge is really, really important whenever it's it's a decision about what what's going to happen around your your child or your children. So, I mean, I spoke to a number of people in relation to that, and and I think that came across really strongly from those who I did did speak to. So, I think that it it is important that we try to ensure that those people feel that they are getting that, um, and that they have confidence in in. The service that they're getting and also they raise the, the exact same issues and i didn't prompt them as to what was in the report but they they raised the exact same issues around being able to converse with or you know consult with their legal representatives and in the remote setting they just weren't able to do that effectively and, and that really concerned them because many of these people are terrified that one wrong word could cost them something in relation to to either access or trying to limit access of of, a, of an aggressive or, or violent partner to their children. So um, just just sort of to, and that's just making a point, Peter, and I know you have it there in the report, but I just wanted to back it up. I think that's a very fair comment. Uh, and again, it was, it was, a, it was a, a very uh, interesting report to, to read, very useful report to read, and, and replicated some of the comments that had been done in research in, in England. Personal choice obviously is very important. If somebody wants to come to court and, and, and see, see the judge face to face and, and have their, client, their solicitor on hand, I mean, that has to be a, a, a really important factor. Um, I, I think we also need to make sure that we're using live link technology appropriately. Um, it may not be that it's ideal for family proceedings that are, are at hearing, but it may well be that the five, six, seven times that you're asked to come along for the case to be discussed and adjourned, um, it's, it's, it's useful to, to prevent that traffic. Um, so it's, I guess it's about using it in the, in the best way. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. Thank you, Peter and Elaine. Thank you. Um, Sinead Bradley and then Paul Frew. Sinead. Thank you, Chair, um, and thanks for the presentation. It, it has been covered. It was um, 
really about that sort of access and the priority, you know, if somebody's saying their case is urgent. But just looking on that um, section around delay, but you refer there to the, you know, the conversations that would have happened in the courthouse and that they were sort of the softer conversations that allowed for maybe settlements to happen and that that has had an impact on, um, I suppose, adding to the delays because those organic um, coming together of parties where they can have a chat um, that hasn't been facilitated. And I just wondered, have or are you aware of if practitioners have found a way of closing that gap of finding a way of having sort of more offline conversations just in the interest of all parties? Because sometimes avoiding court um, is in everybody's interest, not always, but you know there are situations where it are. And I just wondered if anything had come out of this in terms of a learning experience going forward. Thank you. Uh, I think from our point of view, uh, in the early stages of the pandemic, there there was a lot of administrative reviews taking place. So the judge the judge was engaging uh, administratively or by telephone with with the, the the legal reps on both sides of a case to try and make sure that cases were ready, to make sure that areas of dispute were being dealt with, so that by the time it came in to use up uh, precious court time, they, they were in a, in, in a state of readiness. That kind of discussion, that kind of front-end discussion is, is really important and I think should, should be a feature uh, as, as we move forward. Similarly, the, the professions themselves, the, the Law Society and the Bar, I, I know are, are actively looking at accommodation and facilities which would help um, pre-court discussion, whether that's pre-court as in cases listed that day or even cases which are, are yet to be listed, um, because that is the, the, the bit, as you say, that, that has been particularly challenging during the pandemic. You, you don't have everybody in the same place to have those chats to try and get things resolved or to narrow the issues. Again, I can see tech, I could see technology playing a role and, and under the modernization under our modernization program, again, it's about trying to manage cases in the best way possible. So it may well be that there's more use of Yep. <laughs> it may well be that there is more use of technology going forward to, to bring parties together, either with or without the judge. Um, we shouldn't be in a position where a case needs to have everybody gather physically in a courtroom several times just to allow a case to be progressed. We, we have to find smarter ways of working. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Paul Free. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, yeah, there, there's a yin and a yang to that yeah. issue uh, whereby we know there are so many parents out there who are trying to gain access, even limited access to a, a child or children uh, who cannot. And it's simply not only because their relationships have broken down to the point where they communicate or don't, uh, they won't engage, one party won't engage with the other, but simply because of the speed of courts and and everything that goes with that, and then there's a claim or a, an allegation, and and that just spirals into delay. Social services are involved, and then that's just a there is a massive issue that this justice committee will probably have to grapple with, if not in this term, the next term. A wider issue, of course, uh, around parental alienation. Which I don't believe we have taken seriously. No one has taken seriously us here in the legislature and the courts and tribunal service. Uh, that's maybe you think maybe unfair, Peter, but it's just as I see it, and the more I'm getting getting ex, uh, experience on this subject, uh, it, it seems it strikes me as one of the biggest issues that we probably haven't been able to get the grips with, which we really do need to. Uh, and that's not that's not to put blame on anyone, certainly nope. not you guys, but it's just the, the whole issue around it is, isn't terrible. Also, can I pick up on what Linda said uh, around the tribunals? Uh, I would love to hear from the experiences of the tribunal staff themselves, or the volunteers maybe is a better word, uh, but, yeah. uh, and how they have felt their experience has been with the whole system. I, I can tell you, and it's maybe just my representation, but I've seen a marked difference in in outcomes, and for my constituents, it would be negative. 
Uh, now, of course, every case is different, and I'm not going to cast aspersions, but it struck me that whilst written form was always available, when some of my constituents required or asked for written opinions, it was the tribunal staff themselves who said, no, we want to see you. The tribunal members? Oh, sorry, tribunal members, sorry. Uh, sorry, I'm completely wrong there. Tribunal members is what I meant at the start. Thank you for that. Uh, no, they wanted to see them in person. And I can actually agree with that. Uh, my advice has been, if you can throw the weight, please hold off for a physical hearing. Um, because I just do not think that whenever you've got a particular person uh, with particular issues, you know, technology or phone call just doesn't cut it for me. Uh, and I, I think there's something missing from that. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, you know, hearings in a physical sense won't necessarily be perfect either and won't. It's all, it's all about the person. It is. And don't get me wrong, it's a tremendous effort to assist someone, to support someone on the day, to get there, and as Linda has said, to even wait on delay. Uh, and the, you know, different members uh, do things differently and, and, and have their own ways about it. So, you know, you can build up partners and stuff while you're waiting. So there is all those issues, and it's, it's not perfect, but physical hearing is probably the best way of doing it. So I wouldn't. Whilst choice is, is my advice has always been go physical, and and I think that is the best way. And given the fact that the members have on many occasions with me, even against my advice, uh, constituents have went for written appeals. It's the appeal member, the tribunal members have said no. We want to see. Yeah. So, I think uh, in relation to benefits appeals in particular, whenever, whenever we did that exercise to offer people the different uh, options, more than half, I think almost 60% of them said that they would prefer face-to-face -face hearings, the appellants themselves. Um, but the feedback from those who did opt for the, the video hearings has been positive. Um, I, I think it's, it's one of those things, uh, th there will undoubtedly be personal preference on the part of the appellant, on the part of the panel. Um, I, I think that there, there is a certain unfamiliarity or, uh, or, or nervousness around new technology, and maybe as it becomes more and more embedded, it, it, it will become uh, less, less scary. Um, I, I know from speaking to uh, tribunal members and, and judges in a range of areas, there is, that, there is a sense that, well, you need somebody in the room to be able to assess credibility, you need somebody in the room to be able to properly weigh their evidence. And again, I think that's about using the technology appropriately. I think there are lots of times when that isn't pivotal, and therefore technology is appropriate. Um, but, but yes, I can understand what you're saying. Um, I, I, I don't have any data whatsoever about whether uh, virtual hearings result in different outcomes than, than physical hearings. I'm not even sure whether that has been tracked in, in other jurisdictions, but it would certainly be something that would be worth looking at. Yeah, it's probably, probably my representation. Um, <laughs> uh, but but even even fo phones are really bad. F phone because you can't phys physically see or visualise anything. You could have the greatest actor on the end of the phone, and it's not just for my constituents; it's the other way about too. You know, because what we ultimately want here is justice. You know, we want people to get what they need. What their you know their conditions warrant. We don't want anyone to get something that they're not entitled to. So it actually works both ways. And, you know, there is an onus on the appellant uh, in that regard, and representatives can only support, really, and, 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 and assist. So, so it, it does, it's something that really worries me going forward. It is. Uh, it's interesting to note that some of the individual tribunals have, have changed their practices slightly. Um, the, the Parole Commission, for example, uh, have been doing a lot of their, their hearings uh, virtually now uh, rather than travelling up to the prisons. Um, but, but one of the steps that they've taken is that where there is a refusal following a hearing, it's relisted again in six months' time rather than 12 months' time. Uh, and and that, that, it has resulted in a, an increase in their caseload, yeah. but it, it seems to be, it seems to be a, sort of a, a sensible a, approach. I, I think I've had two in the period of lockdown where 
Mike and Steven have said to me after the event, uh, I hate talking on phones, I don't like it. <laughs> you know, so there is an issue, I think there's a real issue there. Uh, maybe you covered this and maybe I just hadn't listened or heard, uh, Peter, but um, all courthouses, with the exception of the three smallest hearing centres, have reopened. Yes. Remem remind me what three of the Mr. Van, Lemavadi and Mackerfield. Right, okay. And, and is there, is, do you see those opening up soon? Or, or is, is it all about social distancing? It, it's social distancing and ventilation um, because right. it doesn't it doesn't have it doesn't have mechanical they don't have mechanical ventilation and they don't have enough natural ventilation um, to, yeah. to allow them to be used and then obviously the capacity is an issue. Um, if social distancing again reduced to a metre, it could be something that could, we could revisit. Um, there are some individual courtrooms in our bigger courthouses which are closed for ventilation issues as well. So it's not just those three venues. Okay, again, you know, safety. If you've you've already said safety is paramount, so. There's no issue there. That's me. That's <laughs> Linda. Do you want to kick in? Paul's left the room again. <laughs> yeah, I look yeah, there. I look uh, there, and I see uh, an empty chair. So, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. L listen, I, I'm gonna let Rachel come in, but just very quickly before I do, um, Peter, just to reiterate and and I accept what Paul's actually saying around the fact that some people will want face to face, and that's why it was very clear that it, it needed to be an option, but not the not the default, and I would never, ever suggest that anybody does a written um, appeal because based on papers, it's simply based on the papers that the initial decision was made on, and I, would, I have never known one to be overturned based on it, so I would never recommend that, but I certainly do think that there is a place for the option of the, of the remote hearing, whilst still obviously given the option of, of the face-to-face -face also and I, I agree with Paul on that but sorry I'm I'm taking up time there where Rachel's supposed to be coming in okay Rachel thank you um and thank you very much there have been quite a lot uh, covered so I'll not I'll not go into loads of details about appeals um I think that's been discussed we could talk about this all day I'm sure um, just in terms of the live links, um, how is that going? Has there been any technical issues, any issues brought up um, or raised? Is everything working kind of quite well? And have there been any reviews of that, um, the live links technology or surveys about user surveys, you know, with victims who are using that at the moment? I would just be interested to know if there's any information on that. Um. Uh, sorry, in, in relation to live links, uh, uh, literally, we, both, we, both I, we, we weren't sure who was going to go there. In, in relation to live links, um, yes, th there were certainly issues at the start. Uh, I think the the newness of the technology, the the unfamiliarity of the processes, uh, certainly resulted in, in some confusion. Some of that, in fact, a lot of that was down to user uh, issues, so pe people not muting, getting lots of feedback, things like that. Um, some of it was. Uh, down to things which we could address. Uh, we, we, we had site link licenses which we moved around from court to court and that resulted in some confusion. People weren't sure what, what should they be logging into. Um, so we've tried to take steps to simplify it. We, we now have dedicated site link uh, licenses for each courtroom that we have. So every solicitor, every, and, and it's, it's noted on the top of the court list, which is available online with the, the login details. So uh, there's, there's a lot more certainty and a lot more um, stability for, for people who are logging on. Um, I, I think that um, as we have gone along, we, we've been continuing to refresh our, our technology solutions, our, our, our courtroom technology. So again, we have a, a, a bit more stability on that front. You can't rule out uh, links going down. You, you, you can't rule out um, broadband capacity issues arising. I mean, we, we get them in, in the office as, as much as we get them in court. Um, so so it, it's trying to, to reduce those as, as much as possible. Um, feedback from free feedback from customers, whether they're professional customers or individual customers, uh, at this stage is probably largely anecdotal. Um, uh, and again, you you tend to hear more of the complaints than you do of the positive experiences. But but where but where we get complaints, we we respond to them and we try and investigate what has been the cause of an issue. Um, audibility. Audibility has been probably one of the biggest challenges as, as people stand up or turn away from the microphone. Um, you know, a judge, a judge or a barrister looks over to their papers and therefore isn't talking into the, the microphone. Um, and, and it's just things like that, things like that where 
once we once we articulated them in a protocol and shared that with the law society and the bar, they started to reduce as well. Thank you. You know, appreciate that. I think we all in the last year have yeah. certainly come across some interesting problems with using a variety of platforms. I can't imagine how it will work in a court setting or in terms of you know access and justice and. And, and, and dealing with that. So um, I know I absolutely appreciate kind of the teeth and problems that could be in there. Um, I, don't, I don't think we've had, I don't think we've had anybody appear with a cat filter on the way they had oh, in the court in Texas, but. Fair, <laughs> Not yet, anyway, there's always room for that. Well, um, no, do appreciate the kind of teeth <laughs> But if there, you know, if there's any issues that have been brought up with, you know, alleged victims or victims that through this process, you know, obviously if there's a protocol in there now between, um, between the, the, the agencies involved, you know, that's certainly welcome. Um, and it's good that things had been had been looked at and and, and moved on. Um, so my second question is the use of the waterfront as the Nightingale facility. Sorry, the ICC. It'll always be the waterfront to me. Yes, um, me too. I see it's there to the twenty fifth of June this year. But is there any uh, sort of flexibility or kind of wiggle room in that date? Um, and uh, with the uh, sort of the relationship with Belfast City Council on that. Yeah. And if if you know if required. Um, could business continue in the waterfront if needed? Yeah, I think throughout this entire process, uh, the City Council and, and the waterfront management have, have worked really positively with us. The, the, the way they've engaged with us, the, the way they've supported us to get the ICC up and running. Um, and and it, it's really been it's, it's, it's been a pleasure to, 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 to work with them. Um, they are keen to continue to work with us to uh, support court business for as long as possible. Uh, they, they obviously don't know how restrictions are going to change on indoor events, indoor entertainments, um, and, and therefore I, they, they, they didn't formally go beyond the end of June with us. But I think they would be keen to work with us to support uh, as much of our needs as possible as we move into the summer. It may well be that we can't have large blocks of it the way we do at the minute, but it may be that we can use smaller parts of it for specific proceedings. So I, I would hope that that relationship will continue for some time yet. Well, absolutely, especially if it is working well for people, and um, I don't see why not. You know, we don't know what's going to happen in June. Um, I personally don't even know what's happening right now. Um, <laughs> you know, we haven't received a statement yet, so I don't even know uh, what's being announced currently. So we don't really, we don't know what's going to happen in a couple of weeks, and we don't, certainly don't know about June. Um, and as we saw last year, you know, anything can happen. Um, and as we sort of reopen and try and readjust, so as long as that, if that's still um, is that still an option for you to have, I think that's probably a good one to continue with. Yep. And just finally, Peter, just with regard, the minister had made a statement not too long ago to the assembly on modernisation, um, and that was fairly comprehensive. There was lots in it, and I appreciate that some of uh, the modernisation program has been accelerated around COVID. You know, with again with the use of live links and, and the techno technology technology side of the court system um but other other parts may not have been able to start or commence but just in terms of you have any plans going forward for the rest of this year um on that modernization piece yes i think the as, as i mentioned just very briefly at the, at the start uh, one of the things that we would be keen to progress this year is the electronic bundles greater use of electronic bundles now that can cover, cover a swathe of options. You could have something from a very basic PDF that just gets accessed by the parties to something which is a bit more all singing, all dancing, which allows parties to serve it between themselves, to annotate it, to update it, to add to it. Um, and we're working with a couple of companies just to uh, test a couple of those options uh, between now and the end of June. I think that will probably be the, the, the big focus, as, as well as continuing to roll out the technology and refresh the technology infrastructure in, in courts and tribunals. I think that that, that will be one of the, the key features of the current year. Um, Anthony Harbinson, who is the new director of the court service, uh, is actually interviewing today for a, a chief modernization officer who will come in and, and will lead that work. Uh, and again, I think that will be very valuable, dedicated resource to, to drive it forward. Um, for, you know, up until now, it has sat under me and has been taken forward in tandem with all the other things that, that I'm taking forward. 
Um, so to have, a, to have a dedicated senior lead on it, I think, will, will really give it much, much needed impetus and, and very, very important impetus. So that will be the focus for the incoming year. Um, we're also, we have commissioned a range of surveys in relation to the estate side, um, and most of those have now been received. Uh, and I think building, using them, we will then start to develop the estate strategy and the, um, the assets uh, management program that we need to try and prepare the estate for the future. Um, we've also been doing some initial engagement with City of Derry and Straban Council just in relation to a possible major capital project up in, in the northwest. Um, and again, that hasn't got any further than a, a preliminary business case, um, but it is one where we know the, the, the facilities in Bishop Street certainly wouldn't be what we would hope they would be. Um, and and that, that is one of the, the key priorities of the estate side of the modernization programme. Thank you, Peter. I really appreciate your answers there. That's all from me, Chair. I forgot it was the chair there for a minute. Apologies. We all kept quiet just to end you up. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sinead, I think you had your hand up, but I think it was from before. Is that right? Thank okay. you. Yeah, it's no thank problem. You. Thank you. No problem, Sinead. Thank you. And thank you to, to Peter and Elaine for your presentation. Appreciate you coming here today and um, giving us all of the answers that, that, that you were able to. So appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and members, that is unless anybody has anything else that they want to raise. That's the end of our meeting. And the next meeting will be next Thursday, same time, roughly the same place. <laughs> to wherever you to be next Thursday. So um thank you all of you for Good your input today. Thank you. Take care. Okay, thank you. All the best.